Okay. So, but Fred, as you mentioned, how do we share? Hi. Just to make sure, like you were saying, that we make sure that everybody has time to talk. Uh, there is, yeah. Um, and you want yes. us to do that? Yes. So, uh, my colleague Shayla and myself will be moderating. So, essentially, we, you just wait for our question, but when someone asks, you can jump in as well and and add you can ask someone as well so it's we're going to try and have a, a lively conversation here i think that the only uh, point i wanted to raise was with this specific masterclass we've been very lucky we have multiple experts uh, turning up at the same time so uh, but but we have two and a half hours in the end so it is essentially i did we, we have enough time to talk about many things uh, the other thing we've done is typically we follow a specific a, the career of you know specific experts, uh, but given the the, the cross cutting nature of the topics we're discussing today, we put together multiple you know um, uh, documentation that are not necessarily your publications. Some of them are your publications, but not all of them. But there are areas where you are experts. So. Um, you know, we will be, we will just be inviting you into, we'll throw a question out there, we will target someone with it, but anyone else can, can answer. Uh, and then just, just try to be considerate with time so that, you know, it look like spending four minutes per question. So, to do that. I also just want to let you know that uh, we are now live on YouTube already, so uh, I've activated the process and I'm just waiting for Shayla, my colleague, to join, and then and then we get this started. Uh, Manuel, good. I see that you have been able to unmute. So that's yes. good. Good morning. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. That's good. And uh, Professor Abraham is joined as well, so that should be great. Just, I think, for sometimes my internet cuts, so I disappear. I try to connect again, but yeah, I might just, just disappear just, sometimes. Just, so, yeah, <laughs> someone just, just. No problem, just connect again um, when, when the internet uh, uh, disappears. Sheila is joining right now, so uh, she will hold forth for two minutes and then we, and then we begin. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that. Um, uh, what was this? Um, we try as much as possible that the images that we use, that there's some credit associated with them. But sometimes we miss. So if, if you see anything in there, it's okay that during your conversation, you can just mention that person. You know, you can just make sure you mention that name. Because we're hosting these things live on our, on our YouTube and if it stays there for 10 years, someone might come back hunting us and hunting down on us. And but we try as, as possible to, to give credit. Sometimes we miss it. So if you see that, please just you know point it out. And you can just mention it in passing, you know, just like this this image is from um from so and so and you know it works that way. It uh, it helps. Sheila, how are you? Sorry guys, the, the noise is gonna end. Shopping, so. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Sula. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Hello, how are you? Good, good. Yeah. Welcome so, on board, everyone. Thank you, yeah. thank you for have, inviting us. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we are very lucky that we have to be. <laughs> we have 300 people registered for the masterclass. It's possible that about 180 of them will join live. The rest will probably watch on YouTube. Maybe more. We don't know. Right now, there's 123 people on the line waiting. Um, and, and we'll just click that in, in, in to bring them on, on board um, uh, right now. So, uh, Shella, is it okay if uh, I take my two minutes and then we start? Meanwhile, I project the slide. Yes, please. Excellent. And then you can continue the chat. Or oh, do you want me to admit everybody already? 
Um, take your two minutes, and then you can admit everyone when you're back. Okay, so you guys have fun. <laughs> have the most fun. <laughs> you can have a conversation about anything. It's really successful, your masterclass, really. Yeah? It's just, it's great, really. You've done like a just tremendous job to be able to put, I think it's better than all the Victor Control Working Groups. When you see the attendance, actually, you you just eat the spot. Huh? No, I don't, I can't even, but no, I don't. We are lucky, Karin. I think. We, I think we are lucky that, that we, have, uh, we have so many experts, so. Natasha, you forgot that the boss from this WG <laughs> is with us. <laughs> no, but I, but I'm surprised there was no more people in the vector control working group. I mean, actually, I think it should have been even more than that. Um, but yeah. Shella, can you confirm you see the slides? Yes. Um, I just can't see. I think the bottom. I don't know. Um, is that all you want us to see? I can't see what you have, like I think the footnotes. Can you move on to the next slide? Then? Uh, if you just move, leave your screen uh, silent for a moment, that, that bar will disappear. Is that what you mean? No, no, just move to the next slide. Okay, the previous, the second slide. Yeah, so it's cutting off some words, but should be okay. Is that is that the same for everybody? No, I can see the whole thing. No, I can see everything. Yeah. So I guess it's yeah, on my side. Yeah. yeah. One minute and we stop. At the very bottom of the slide, I can see two little lamps. Mm -hmm. I see four lines in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Bottom one starting with PBO. Yeah. Like a vision. So I guess it's, it's on my end. I wonder what's happening. Did you guys have any questions? Or did Fred answer all of them? Corinne can help us answer because she's been with us before. <laughs> yeah, so in full disclosure, it was Corinne who answered all the questions. It was not Fred. Uh, oh. Yeah, I think we're good to go. <laughs> That's very generous, too. <laughs> I think it's true, though. Are those what are those lamps on the bottom? Are those translucent emanators or cups of coffee? Or so they're actually traditional lamps, paraffin lamps. Ah, uh, okay, I see it. Yeah, so you have like paraffin and a wick. Gotcha. Yeah. So is the discussion going to follow this order? That seems to be here. It will be random. <laughs> it will be random and we want to make it as lively as possible and you guys can chime in where you feel you have very strong opinions. Yeah. But can you imagine, like, for the IRS, like, Manuel and, uh, and Joe, with all the work done, uh, and also Corinne for the, the hurt and everything else. Yeah. Hello, Namur. Nihon, 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 Ah, Shell, I think we can start, right? Yeah, let's start. I'll let's take start. you. Good. I've been letting, we have 174 people on the line. I'm letting all of them in at the same time. 
Um, yes, sasa huko kwa mangi naenda kwenye pamoja mtawa wetu kwa hapa Busha. Mshirika Abraham briefly. Mwambie aende kwa pamoja mtawa wetu kwa hapa. Welcome uh, friends, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so so much to all our experts for making time to be with us today. Uh, this is the 36th edition of our master classes and we are very excited to be with you guys. Uh, today we have a very very interesting topic. Uh, we will be doing a deep dive on insecticide treated badness and indoor residual spraying for malaria control. We've been wanting to do a masterclass on indoor residual spraying for a long time, uh, but we haven't been able to. Uh, today, for the first time, we're going to do you know, a two-part masterclass, one, one part focused on indoor residual spraying, and another part focused on, on the um, uh, insecticide-treated nets. I would also like to, to say, like, like we mentioned last time, that uh, uh, we try as much as possible to keep these masterclasses as a platform for technical discourses, scientific conversations in detail, long form. Uh, we uh, try as much as possible to be a political, uh, not political at all in these masterclasses. Uh, we seek knowledge from whatever source it may come. And so we, we scan the horizon and also, you know, um, we talk to people to give us references and we invite experts on specific topics without any preferences for, um, you know, we, we, we probably should, but we try usually to not, not go into things such as regional balance, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we, we just try to find the, the best expert in this space who is available. And, and I think so far we've been really, really lucky uh, that we've had that. Um, and and um, we hope that this will continue. The second point I want to mention is that uh, we were planning to have a, a masterclass with the Innovative Vector Control Consortium, IVCC. This was gonna be uh, two weeks back on the on 14th, on the 21st, I believe, of April. Uh, because of a COVID infection, we, we moved that masterclass. Uh, it is likely to happen now on the 26th of May, so a week from now, and we will provide you with the necessary information for that. My colleague and, and uh, Shayla and I will be hosting this masterclass today. Uh, unfortunately, our other colleague, uh, Nana Abba, is uh, unable to join today but she will be joining with us again on the next uh, masterclass. So ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, uh, this is, um, event is being st streamed live on our YouTube channel. And I will request my Ifakara colleagues to kindly share the YouTube link on the, on the chat box. We also ask you guys to stay as always as active on, the, on, on the chat as well. And we request our experts to be looking at the chat and, and to ask, answer as many questions as we can. Sheila, can you just confirm that you're back online? Yes, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and I think we can proceed. Yeah. Go ahead, Sheila. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I had some technical challenges uh, when we just started, but I'm here now. So today we have a privilege of hosting um, very renowned uh, experts on IRS and bed nets, um, both new and old. Um, so it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Can you mute? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting conversation on um, vector control, really, on vector control products, the classical ones. So we'll start off by taking sort of um, Sorry, guys. We'll start off by taking a history lesson on where IRS started from the evolution of bed nets and IRS as well. Um, we'll take a deep dive um, on insecticide resistance and look at the new nets 
um, or the new products that we have for IRS, the new insecticides. Uh, we'll go into the operational aspects of both IRS and bed nets, the combination aspects, where should we be using IRS, where should we use bed nets, how do these interventions affect or um, relate um, or merge with the different vector behaviors. Uh, we will also look at the, re the relationship between vector control interventions and anopheles stephensi given its behavior and its um, uh, preferred habitats. We will look at um, where to use the bed nets, how to use them, how to measure the impact of these interventions and the different ways in which we measure the efficacy of vector control interventions, IRS and bed nets. And then if we have time, we'll go into the cost effectiveness of IRS. We all hear stories that IRS is quite effective. So we'd love to hear from our experts, especially Professor Manuel telling us from the history and where we are now, how cost effective is this or how we can actually make it more cost effective. So you're all welcome and let's have some fun. Fred. Um, yeah, that, that, that was a, a good intro. And I think, um, you know, it's, for me, I always find it very interesting. Um, um, Joe, you've attended many of these masterclasses before and you, you must, you know, probably get tired now. How many times we mention uh, nets, insecticides, uh, uh, drugs, diagnostics. But this is the situation we have. I mean, our arsenal is growing, but it's still fairly small. Our tools are still very traditional, but uh, fortunately impactful. And so we have a situation where malaria control is really dominated by, by just commodities, you know, nets, insecticides, and, 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 and drugs, and, and diagnostics. Uh, there are other options there, uh, but I think at the moment we have to figure out, okay, as, as, as we we expand this arsenal, we also have to figure out how do we maximize on the value of this uh, 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 intervention. So we will be talking a lot about that. But I would like us to, you know, first of all, uh, just throw out a random question there to <laughs> to, to any of you. Uh, let's start with Seth Irish, uh, for example. Seth, do you have a preference between any of these? Which of the two would you would you say is your preferred intervention, bed nets or IRS, and why? I feel like, I feel like that's a trick question. Um, no, I, I actually try to, um, I try to approach the question as dispassionately as I can, because I think there are situations where IRS might be more effective. I think there are situations where ITNs might be more effective. And I think the, the point that was raised about cost effectiveness is, is a huge one. Uh, because if you're spraying with a very cheap chemical, then IRS can be can be very effective and and very cost effective. Uh, as IRS insecticides have become more and more expensive, I think that's really led to a reduction in in how many houses are sprayed and led us to think about potential other options. Um, and as ITNs uh, have gone from being pyrethroid only ITNs to PBO nets or dual uh, insecticide nets. They have become more expensive, but also potentially more effective. And I'm sure Natasha and Corinne will talk about that. Um, but I think we have to look at the, both the effectiveness of those tools, but then also there are situations where one or the other might be more accepted I know that there's some places where IRS is, is really seen as a much more powerful tool, uh, other areas where that's not an intervention that, that people want. So I think you also have to look at the context. Right. I mean, it's, uh, there's 200 people on this call right now and probably more will join. And I'm sure this is a question that they all you know, struggle with. You mentioned right now that there are places where people prefer IRS, there are places where people prefer bed nets, for what reasons uh, would, would a country, for example, prefer one over the other? Um, and any, anyone of you can, can respond to this. 
I, I can jump in just quickly while while the others prepare their thoughts. But I mean, IRS has some some big inconveniences in terms of uh, oftentimes we ask people to take all of the belongings of their house outside uh, and so that they can spray without applying the insecticide to anything that they use for for eating or drinking. Uh, this can be on a rainy day. That might might be the day that the IRS team shows up. And you can understand why people wouldn't want to take all of their stuff outside on a rainy day. Um, I think there's there's concerns like many people have about insecticide and is this a, a safe intervention for for indoor use? Um, I I think generally it is, but but you can understand that people have concerns about that. And then with ITNs, there's a a, a need to to actually use the net every day. You have to physically put the net down and tuck it in, uh, which requires some effort on the behalf of the people using it. So I'll stop there and let others. Maybe, maybe going back to the ITN and IRS, I think, okay, and I'm, I think both have, I'm going to say, I think both have like um, an effect and then should be considered in different various situation. I think what is happening is with net is that we managed to increase coverage quite drastically. So in a way, uh, so that was with pirate net. So um, the pirate synergies and the dual eye net are like an extension of that, especially for the area, in our, the area with uh, resistance. But I think IRS still have the role and I think when you're looking now that uh, Maya control strategy in country are more about micro stratification. Before it used to be one size fit all, we give that, we do IRS as much as we can in high, but I think now they have this micro stratification and I think that need to guide more and more what you need and what you put. And I think my main concern is about budgets, uh, for implementing all these strategies. So we have more and more tools, but I don't think we have more and more budget. So now we have to choose, we still have to choose, which I think it's it's an error because I don't think one of these is going to be the magic bullet as we all say, and we need a combination, but I think the, the, the budget and funding landscape make that we, people that find like national control strategy have to choose, which I think it's quite a big issue because I think they, could work in synergy and with drugs, with vaccine. And I'm just wondering how that's going to happen in the future. Yeah, and, and that's really interesting that you mentioned the stratification and the budget. Um, and perhaps mosquito behavior is one of the conditions in which you decide where to, um, to use bed nets or where to use IRS. So looking at this, um, and perhaps um, I will let Manuel take take us through this. So this diagram before us is um, sort of illustrating the different mosquito behaviors in relation to both IRS and on the walls and bed nets. Um, so thinking about this, Professor Manuel, um, about the different mosquito behaviors, how do the vector control interventions, let's start with IRS, how does IRS interact with the non-mosquito behaviors? But it, this thing between IRS and NETS is, is a, loaded, it's a loaded question. If I can go back for a second. I think the issue with um, cost is, is a result of, of most programs going either or. If we combine the IRS campaigns with net distribution, the cost savings will be monumental because you're mobilizing a small army in IRS and that mobilized mobilization requires a lot of logistics and that log logistics could be used to move mosquito nets and to do a lot of the things that this community engagement uh, groups are doing normally for IRS and for mosquito nets. And, and right now, in my experience in the last 20 some years, it's either or. I mean, I don't know why, and I still cannot understand why an IRS campaign cannot be part of a, uh, a distribution of mosquito nets. Or if we have a mosquito net campaign, why can't we train those people who are going into these houses to 
either prepare the houses or convey the message of IRS to the population so they can accept that uh, intervention. Because after all, if the population doesn't accept it, it doesn't matter what you do, they won't, um, they won't accept it, okay? So there's, uh, and, and again, we can be talking about this for the rest of the day. Uh, and, and we've been going at it for at least 10 years. But why is it that it's only IRS and not mosquito nets if we're going to essentially to the same areas? With regards to the um, behavior of the vector, there is some repellency on the insecticide applied to the wall. And, and a lot of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm an operational guy. I'm not a, uh, uh, a scientist in the strict way of, uh, of, of science. Uh, even though I am, an ent I am an entomologist and I can, I, I've done this. But there is a lot of repellency in, there's some repellency in some of the insecticides used in IRS. And now that we have the, the um, introduction of uh, Stefensi in, in Africa, uh, that is a indoor, I'm sorry, it's an outdoor day biter kind of thing where mosquito nets are not necessarily effective. We need to figure out a way of well, what are we going to what are we going to do now? I mean, we're going to combine beside after all. IRS is but one of the tools in the mosquito control basket, and we need to use as many tools as possible against this this enemy that is seems to be, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, seems to be winning the battle after twenty years of intervention. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Manuel. Um, do, do we have any of the, the, the other people, um, Joe, Natasha, Corinne? And maybe Corinne, you, if, if you could just take us through, you could start with the bed nets, for example, just how does this, um, uh, this work? How do mosquitoes interact with these interventions inside the house? Yeah, um, thank you. I think I'll try to explain that as uh, quickly as possible, briefly as possible. So I think a, a lot of this is well illustrated in how um, uh, experimental herds work. So I can explain based on my understanding of that. So if a mosquito enters into a home that is occupied with the person sleeping on a net or is treated with an iris, so it approaches through Sorry, I hope I still have the background here. So it approaches through an, an entry point, either say a window or whatever, and it's attracted to the human based on the, the body odors. And if there is a net, the net usually serves as a barrier to prevent the mosquito from feeding and that way can sort of cut off transmission. But if the mosquito is able to feed, then it can feed and leave the, the home to an exit point. Or it could also um, rest after feeding, it can rest on the wall. And that is the point where it contacts the IRS treatment. So there is a, a need for a mosquito to have maybe fed before it can rest on the wall and interact with the iris. And that's where the iris has an effect on mosquitoes. But with, with ITNs, it's it's going to be that the mosquito has to either be able to go through the barrier of the net, maybe the net is hold and it can still feed, or the net could also repel the mosquito or cause it to exit the hut before its time, usually based on that excito repellent effect of pyrethroids. So uh, uh, the mosquitoes could be repelled by the net and then they exit quickly without feeding on the person. So in summary, I think that's how I see how they act. But there is also the deterrent effect, which could be, you could have it for iris and you could also have it for items where mosquitoes are sort of prevented from entering a home based on uh, uh, also the exciting effects of uh, the insecticides that are either on the wall or on the items. No, th thank, thank you so much uh, for that. Go ahead, uh, Sheila. <laughs> No, I, I was just following the chat um, and, and there's um, some interesting discussion happening there around um, outdoor biting both in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and perhaps, Joe, you could take us through this intricacy in terms of, you know, different insecticides having different modes of action 
and uh, vectors also biting and resting out the houses where both these two interventions really work on, on vectors that prefer indoors. Your comments there, Joe, please. Yeah, sure. And, and there's, there's a whole lot to unpack even in just there. So I'm going to talk and anyone cut me off at any time. But the first thing, you know, and to speak to Manuel's point from a little bit ago, I do think 10 years ago, it was a little bit more complicated because everyone recognized the limited repertoire of chemicals that existed. And so people were hesitant to put pyrethroids on a wall if there were also, also pyrethroids on the nets in the community. I think from a you know, resistance management perspective, that wasn't such a good idea. But in the recent past, in like in the last 10 years, now there are new chemicals for IRS and now new chemicals on the bed nets where it makes a lot more sense to, in some situations, consider layering these interventions on top of each other. Now you've got different chemical classes and each one of these affects mosquito behaviors in different ways. And, and Corinne is actually one of the groups leading, trying to dissect how these different chemical classes interact with one another and when might the use of two different things be contraindicated and this sort of thing. But um, I do think what I'm saying is that even though we're still talking about IRS and we're still talking about bed nets and these are ancient technologies, we are in the space now where we can maybe think about them in new ways. Um, and then real quick, let me transition to the indoor outdoor biting uh, phenomenon, which is so fascinating and has such a, uh, an important impact on disease transmission. But it's not as simple as saying that both of these interventions are indoor interventions. Therefore, it only targets indoor feeding. Um, I think if I can just cite one example from Mozambique, where there's a really high burden of malaria and the vector is an obvious funestus. Turns out that this populations of Funestus are very opportunistic feeders. And so when we use the human landing collection to identify indoor and outdoor ratios or indoor and outdoor biting, oftentimes we record an awful lot of outdoor biting. And yet you can go in and you can do indoor residual spraying with an effective chemical, a chemical to which the mosquitoes are susceptible. And you can crash the rates of outdoor biting. And what we think is happening, if you look at the diagram on the screen, is that a mosquito is happy to take a blood meal from a person who's seated outside. We'll take that blood meal and go indoors and rest on the wall and then have a, have a pretty good impact anyway. And so it's a diff challenging thing to do, but we, we don't always well describe the location of all of these mosquito behaviors and how we're a little too quick to discount the efficacy of an intervention that might still be really effective given the right circumstances. So, so, so are you saying then, are you guys saying that, and, and, and my colleague Jerry Klein has, 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 has written about this in the past too, that, you know, if, if you have an intervention that works very well indoors, that impact can also be seen on the outdoor biting populations. That's like, possible. Always, I think okay. it, it helps to, very, to, to, to well characterize your mosquito population because that's going to vary from species to species and probably location to location, but it certainly is possible. Yeah. And just to cite another quick example is that for the first time in a long time, I've, I've seen outdoor use of some of the new nets. So people are taking their bed nets with them outdoors and in mass in whole communities. And so this is a beautiful thing. And I think people are figuring out that there are different ways to interact with these interventions to maximize their efficacy in, in my own home or in my own community. And so, you know, the situation is always yeah. a little more complex than we make it out. No, thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank you guys for that. Uh, just hold your thought a little bit, Manuel. Uh, um, thank you so much for this. We're going to try and and move this along, but but let's stick to that point because I think we should we should capture it uh, the, very quickly. Hold on, I, I need yeah. to I need to add this, Fredros. I mean, I realize yes, that we're talking about m malaria is mostly in Africa, but we need to be thinking about the rest of the world. We Correct. have dengue fever, okay? We have mosquitoes that are attacking in in Asia, in South America, and then we even have IRS in Chagas disease. And, and, and we need to remember that what we do for malaria vectors in Africa doesn't necessarily apply to South America, Asia, or even IRS against um, Chagas. And, and we can continue that later on. No, thank you. Thank you. Just, just quite, quite quickly, thanks for making that point. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you so much. Can I say something? Yes, yes, Sabra. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, I'll come back to the point on uh, 
uh, vector behavior in relation to the use of the, the two interventions. But let me go back uh, uh, on your first question on NETs and IRS. I, I'm so pleased that you didn't ask this question to a politician because <laughs> if you had asked a politician, they would definitely say they, they would love to see IRS. For what reasons, I really don't know and I don't want to dwell on that, but I like what the others have, have contributed in terms of uh, uh, the use of the two interventions based on the situation stratification. But uh, I'd like, you see, I think IRS would work better because we don't have evidence in areas of where, where the intention is really malaria elimination because of the rapid impact as opposed to uh, the use of bed nets. But unfortunately we don't have, I don't think we do have studies that have really looked at the use of uh, ITNs in areas where the objective is malaria elimination. That's one. Uh, uh, my friend Manuel spoke about the need for use of combination of the two interventions, but certainly realizing that uh, most of these, uh, and, and I'm talking about Africa, maybe elsewhere it's different, but most of these interventions are externally funded. I mean, if countries like African countries can mobilize their own domestic resources, maybe uh, there could be room for use of uh, you know, combination of uh, the two interventions. How, how cost effective that would be, I, 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 I wouldn't really know, but uh, I, I doubt if there'll be any additional impact necessarily. Maybe there are situations where the use of uh, the two interventions could work well and be cost effective, uh, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't have that, that, that uh, evidence. Uh, so I think countries should really be encouraged to mobilize their own domestic resources so that they can choose because there's no way, no way a global fund or PMI, the major funders for malaria interventions in Africa would, uh, would agree to that because it's very, very costly. Uh, in terms of behavior, I, I like what Joe mentioned uh, because that, 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 that was my point that if we can encourage communities to innovatively uh, use or take the business outdoor, then the, the, the issue, the problem of outdoor biting would be, would be addressed. But let us not forget that there are certain species of uh, mosquitoes that bite outdoor, but actually rest indoors, which means they can also be impacted by the use of uh, nets and IRS. Over to you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so, so much. I hope you can still hear me. We're looking for uh, volunteers to help us manage the, the, the chat. So, uh, Halfan, if you're around, I've made you a co-host. Uh, you can help Shell and myself, as you notice, Nana isn't with us today. And the chat is quite active, and we want to make sure that we are capturing all these uh, questions. So if you can help me with that, and also with admitting people into the, into the masterclass, that would be truly appreciated. Abraham, um, uh, Joe, Manuel, uh, uh, thank you guys so much for, for, for bringing us back to, to those specific points. I want us to move forward a little bit and, and just go back to the issue of uh, mosquito behavior. Someone mentioned that there's malaria also beyond Africa. We appreciate this. Um, but we do see certain unique features of malaria vectors uh, uh, in Africa, and one of them is really the very high human blood indices, uh, the fact that they are mostly uh, biting humans inside the house and so on. The, the main ones are Anopheles gambif, Anopheles honestus, Anopheles apiensis. So if, if, you, if you were to think about that as a risk factor, it would be nice to, to hear from you, um, and, and Natasha and, and Seth, uh, um, how these behaviors, how these Africa Afrotropical vector behaviors make them most susceptible to to ITNs and IRS. So of course, of course, we recognize that these tools are also applicable beyond Africa. But it, it it seems that you know their behavior is particularly suitable suitable for this 
uh, interventions in Africa. Can, can you guys talk to that a little bit? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so I think I can discuss a little bit about maybe looking at Fonesca's Gambia Cisatric to and Arabian Seas, because uh, I'm agree with Joe, I think Fonesca and Gambia that that would at least also again, I'm talking more about East Africa and we'll just enter the, the houses and bite and then rest on the door. Arabian Seas, actually in Tanzania, we found Arabian Seas inside, they come inside, but we don't find a resting on the morning. So they come inside. So they might encounter the net mate or not, but they will they might bite or not, depending if they prefer to bite uh, people or um, cattle or no, everything, but they will go out. And I think what was interesting for Fenestas and uh, Gambia as a stricto is that, yeah, they'll, they'll enter. And, and what we saw, and that's something, uh, maybe a discussion is about the different impact of IRS and NET with Fenestas and Gambi. For example, what we saw, and then that come later, this may be with the PPO net, is the, we have indication that the PPO net might work better with Gambia South District 2 than in Fenestas. And because in this area we did also IRS, while IRS was crashing uh, Fenestas really quickly. So I think this is some of this discussion to see, okay, um, that maybe Fenestas spend some time in the wall before going biting so that they might be more exposed to IRS on the wall. So I think that's, I think this is all the kind of behavior that should be used also to decide what to use. Because if we find that like maybe the PBO net doesn't work as well, uh, then IRS uh, for Fenestas and that will be, and it's very more the case of, I don't know, but I think Fenestas is the main vector in lots of area. So I think that we, it's really important to get this information also to be able to target the appropriate uh, intervention. And, um, and I think Arabians is probably something that's more complicated because uh, Arabians is there. So I think what we're seeing in all the study we've done is that we managed to knock down Fenestas and Gambia, but Arabians is there and, and actually the density is increasing. So um, of course it depends in some of the area uh, like this part of Tanzania where we've been working on, on the lake, it's not as a good vector. So uh, really the transmission is really given by Fenestra Sengam Institute. We find a low number of Arabian cis that uh, actually carry the sporozoites. So I think this is something again, to understand what's happening with Arabian cis. Do they not feed in the world? Do they? So I think there is uh, all more work to do that, just to understand that and to see how we target each of them. And I think that's why I think the, the different, even within the same, like within nets, maybe one would be better for Gambia to use Fenestas. So I think this is something that needs to be looked at a little bit more. Joe, if you want to. No, I just agree with everything that Tasha just said. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps uh, talking about Arabiensis, Natasha, uh, perhaps we should shift gears a bit and talk about a related vector, Nofle Stephensai. Um, you said the vector control products uh, may not be as effective against Arabiensis, which outdoor um, an outdoor mosquito. How about an Nofle um, Stephensai with its behavior? How does this interact with IRS and ITNs? Um, Natasha, Seth? Yeah, maybe let's set our other um, less. Yeah. Um, so I think we're st we're still trying to figure out what interventions uh, will be most effective against Stevens Eye. There's there's work from from where it's in its native habitat or India. Uh, Seth, you mind uh, I you mind I interrupt a little bit? Yeah. Uh, just a quick announcement. That, that there's probably some people who have two computers nearby. Uh, or maybe the YouTube active as well, and there's an echo. So um, just for all our participants, if you guys don't mind that you might want to mute the YouTube or whatever other computer might be next to you, so we don't have the echo. Sorry, Seth, I interrupted. Go ahead, please. No problem. Um, so I think I was just saying that um, that there is there is some evidence from from places where they've had this vector for a longer period of time, that ITNs can be effective, IRS can be effective, uh, larvaciding 
can be effective. I see in the chat that John Invest has the solution uh, to the problem that we should be using larvicides. Um, but I think I think we're still trying to uh, understand. Oops, can you hear me? I think we're still trying to uh, understand what are the best ways of of controlling Stevens Eye, especially in Africa. Um, and understanding its behavior is is going to be key to that. I know that we've been trying to understand its behavior through a lot of the collection methods that we've been using, and um, and that's been a challenge. It looks like Manuel, did you want to add something? Well, well the thing is, the the, the appearance of Stefensi in Africa, and and forgive me for saying it like this. But the appearance of Stefensi in Africa, in my humble opinion, is a demonstration of what we're doing is not really integrated vector management. And here we are with a malaria, active malaria vector in Africa, and we're still thinking about our IRS and mosquito nets. And, and in my humble opinion, uh, we need to be thinking out of that box, especially with Stefensi in Africa. Because as uh, I think it was John Inves just said in the chat, you know, larvae siding works. Larvae siding eliminated uh, Egypti from South America. And, and I realized we're gonna have another session on larvae siding and, and environmental management and whatnot. But here's, an, here's evidence that we need to be thinking about IBM and instead of focusing our attention on just mosquito nets and IRS. And I am a pro, as everybody, most people know, I mean, a lot of people in Africa call me Mr. Mr. IRS. And, and, I, and I am a proponent, if we're going to do IRS, but let's do it right, okay? And it requires a, a lot of details and a lot of uh, organizational planning. And I, in my humble opinion, I think a lot of the programs in, in Africa and including IRS campaigns in South America against Chagas and Leishmaniasis in other parts of the world can be improved. But I'll, you know, we need to be thinking again, we need to be bringing into this IBM um, uh, and consider that larvae siding, uh, sorry, that IRS and mosquito nets are tools in that toolbox. And we need to figure out what are we gonna do now? No, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, uh, Shella, do you want to continue? It would be nice to hear Abraham's voice on this as well. Yeah, Abraham can add on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do want to speak about uh, Steven's side. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, think, I guess, the, I guess the, the main question That's the reason is... why Fred perhaps asked me to do so. <laughs> but, Go ahead, Abraham. Go ahead. But that said, um, uh, yeah, let me go back to Arabiensis uh, from where Natasha left. I, I think I like uh, Fenestras and Gambis as a stricter. I think uh, when dealing with uh, Arabiensis, you are, you are dealing with uh, not less than three, three components of Arabiensis. One that would, uh, that naturally carries uh, uh, the DNA that allow the genes that allow allow them to bite in those resting those those will be addressed by IRS and nets. You have another fraction which uh, bites in those, but because of uh, probably selection pressure or because of uh, use of uh, interventions in those, they would come in those bite and and leave the house and rest elsewhere. And then you have one that bites uh, outdoor, outdoors and stays there. So I, I think an uh, understanding of this, I think uh, those who read uh, about uh, the late Mario Colut's uh, work would appreciate why it's so critical to also understand uh, these different components of Arabiensis so that their interventions can be addressed appropriately. Uh, coming, coming back to uh, Steve Insight, certainly I, I totally agree with uh, my, my friend uh, Manuel that uh, we, we need to approach it uh, through an integrated uh, uh, approach uh, that uh, what we normally do 
for the other vectors may, may not adequately address the TV side. Uh, we need to, to, to do more work on, um, on, 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 on larvae side and larval source management because if we can attack, it depends uh, again, if most of these uh, TV side uh, breed uh, uh, in water containers, for example, close to homes, I think definitely a lot of source management would, would, would work. And this is where one, I mean, a program will benefit not only from a malaria point of view, but also the other vector bone, bone, bone diseases. Uh, my concern, I mean, to be honest, uh, for most of our, our researchers, I, I think they are looking at Stephen Sai uh, as a standalone problem. Stephen Sai is not a standalone problem. It has to be looked at broadly, uh, including surveillance. Okay, when the WHO uh, uh, issued the alert, I think they made the point very clear, but how our researchers have approached this, I think uh, there could be a lot of uh, room for improvement in terms of uh, making sure that we, we don't just see Stephen Sai as the only problem. There are so many problems out there, including capacity to carry out uh, surveillance, monitoring for, for, you know, monitoring and evaluation for, for the various interventions. So my, my call here is, yes, we have a problem, but I know for Stephen Sai is a problem, but let us look at it, let, let us look at it broadly rather than, you know, uh, using one lens uh, uh, Stephen Sai and leaving out the other, the other key issues. For example, I know of countries where cases have increased, not necessarily because of the Stephen Sai, just because their capacity to implement the interventions is, is, is weak. And, and all these things should be looked at uh, 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 broadly. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you guys so, so, so much. Uh, Sheila, I think we should close that chapter and move to the next. Uh, this is, this is, you know, it, it's really funny that uh, we try so much to focus a masterclass on a specific topic, but we can never escape level source management. So, <laughs> so, so, so we've agreed now with Manuel and, and, and uh, so uh, 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 Silas, Silas Majandere is on the call that perhaps we should do another masterclass on level source management. But anyway, uh, let's take this forward. Corinne, uh, Corinne, my friend. Corinne, this is Professor Pierre Carnaval. Um, and, and this here is the, as far as I know, I mean, I might be wrong, but as, as far as I understand, this is the very first publication of an ITN being tested for malaria control. It was, it was produced in 1984. Uh, the, the first evidence of insecticide nets use in Africa. Uh, Corinne, you work a lot on ITN, and I just want you to talk a little, a little bit about the progression, how this the technology has progressed since this this, this period uh, when Pierre Carnaval was working in Mosul in the Grand Faso uh, with with Frederic Derrier, and, and others can add as well uh, to where we are today. Corinne, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Craig. I, I, I'm really glad to see Pierre Carnival because uh, the Arab group, IRD group that worked in West Africa in those years was sort of the first who really took on this idea of uh, treating nets with insecticides. And it has led us to where we are today. So it, it actually started about dipping nets as far, I think that's a long time ago. I wasn't present at that time, but the, the idea was that nets were, were to be, were being dipped into insecticides to treat them. And that way you can uh, protect people. And that alone was really very effective. That's just dipping nets from time to time into insecticide solutions and using them. And there were many, uh, studies that showed that they were effective. But the problem with that was that when the nets are washed, the whole insecticide goes away. So you have to keep retreating. And the retreatment itself was very costly and logistically challenging. So the idea of uh, um, long lasting nets came in. And my, I may be wrong, but I understand that uh, Uli said was one of the first long lasting nets that actually was made. And over time now we've had other types of uh, 
uh, pyrethroid nets that came in because most of the pyrethroids were actually really good on nets. They, they were very efficacious and they killed mosquitoes really wonderfully. I, I don't know if we would ever have any insecticide that would be better than pyrethroids when mosquitoes were susceptible to pyrethroids, but that was really a problem. And now we were faced with resistance over the years and we have had to start to look for solutions to uh, uh, pyrethroid resistance and to be able to continue to use this ITN technology and long lasting nets are really very efficacious. So that's not a technology that we want to lose. So over the years now we've had uh, changes in the system and we've had the uh, new types of ITNs that have come in like pyrethroid uh, PBO nets. And now we are going into a new generation nets like pyrethroid fluorofenopy nets and the uh, pyrethroid and the pyroproxyphen nets. So that's what I remember so far about how things have changed with ITNs. Thank you, thank you so, so much. And I, I, I noticed that um, our colleagues from Sumitomo are here and, you know, it was, it was great news at the time in 2000 when uh, Hoopes, then it was called Hoopes instead of PQ, approved LLI, the first LLIN uh, which was all is said. Uh, again, if we have our colleagues from Sumitomo and they want to correct that fact, uh, feel free to do so. But, but uh, Corinne, you're absolutely right uh, on that. Here is a, a little bit of an illustration uh, uh, originally made by Dr. Manuela Runge uh, for the people who were writing together. And, and there are few inaccuracies there, but mostly uh, correct. A lot of development post 2000. And uh, it's unfortunate that we now have the pyrethroid resistance situation. Corinne, uh, thank you so, so much for that. Let's, let's go on to Natasha uh, uh, briefly, and, and then the other members of the, the panel can join in this conversation as well. I would like us to, uh, uh, like you guys to join Shella and myself to discuss a little bit of the community benefits of ITNs, the so-called community benefits, the fact that then let's also help non-users. So Natasha and Seth, actually, could you guys describe what is happening here? I think this is a paper from uh, Professor Bill Holly, just work done just about 20 kilometers from where I was born, actually. So it makes a lot of sense for me. Uh, what's happening here? Um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I, I can't remember too much the, the, the study, but I think what, what they did, they look at um, so they, they, they are yeah, kind of clusters where they were distributing bed nets in one village and then bed nets in another controlled one. And they were just um, then looking at the effect. But then, of course, what's happening is between uh, two clusters that are close, uh, there were like kind of carryover effects because the mosquitoes are moving away. Okay, so I think that they could see that there were maybe less effect in the, in the border, in the control and the bedhead village, because uh, actually mosquitoes uh, have been killed by the bed nets. And then, so even in the control village, where people didn't have a bed net, they still were protected. And then just looking at how far this protection is going. And uh, so just showing that when you distribute, um, um, then you have high usage of nets, uh, it does uh, kill. Uh, and then reduce the density of mosquito, reduce the, the life expectancy. And then even uh, people not uh, protected by the net, uh, that are not using net are protected. And then I think there is just, I don't know, I can't remember what was the, the range uh, uh, in terms of, of protection, but I think just to show that. And I think that's something we see also more and more in the, the trial, because when we do any randomized control trial, we saturate um, the, the people with nets. And then even those, or maybe not, but we manage maybe 60, 70 percent uh, usage. And we can see that even on the people that not using the nets, they still protect it. And I think that's uh, something that's provided by Pyrethroid. And, um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, yeah, that's that, sorry. I don't know if Seth has more to add. Not really, I think it's, it kind of makes sense when you're talking about 
an intervention that has multiple chances to kill mosquitoes and so multiple chances to to get them before they have sporozoites that uh, you could potentially you know start reducing that general overall age of your population and have an effect even where where you don't have nets so it it, it makes sense to me um, but I don't have much more to say than, than that Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, um, just checking whether my, sh my colleague Sheila is. Yeah. Maybe just to add that, I think that this is quite difficult for us. I think it would be nice to really know at, you know, like there is modeling study and then Tom other can do, but just to see at which usage level is this community effect is happening right. really, because I think that will be really to see, okay, is it like 50, 30 percent might be different between the different type of net now that we have, or even uh, between IRS and also nets. That's also, you know, like for IRS, we say 80 percent coverage. Uh, but then net, uh, again, I think it would be interesting to see what's the level of coverage also. Not that we can reduce, but then just to see if we have a community effect, we can um, get. We, you know, Natasha, yeah. there, is, uh, there is this work that uh, uh, Professor Lyons is doing with WHO. It's not published yet, but WHO did put uh, documentation for their meetings online, and I, I think we got it. I believe this is the work. Uh, so I, I hope we're not breaking any rules here. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. I know this work is not published, but it is on WHO. Uh, it's available online. Uh, it's a great description of what you're saying, and, and the conclusion here is that that community effect is happening between 20 and 80 percent coverage, and that it tapers towards the end. Uh, I don't know if anyone in, in, in the chat would like to speak to this, uh, or maybe if Joe Lyons is on the call, I don't know. Um, I'll check. We, we thought this was really powerful, that, that this community level benefit is not from zero to 100. It's, it's, uh, Certain, certain range. Uh, Corinne, uh, Joe, any of our experts, do you guys want to talk to this? Uh, Fredros, I, th I think Tom raises an important point here uh, on the chat that even with one net in your community, there is a, com there is a community impact. <laughs> I, totally, I totally agree with him. That's good, that's good. That's, that's excellent. Uh, and, 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 and this actually brings me back to IRS in terms of coverage, uh, a point that uh, Manuel raised earlier on about capacity. As much as uh, programs that countries would love to do IRS, the capacity to do that is, is, is very weak and is decreasing every day in, 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 in all those those countries. I think these are also some of the issues that we need to take into account. Certainly, uh, this is where perhaps the nets uh, work better, perhaps, especially in areas where programs have a huge challenge of attaining high coverage with uh, the other intervention, IRS in this case. Thank you. If I may add to uh, Abraham's point, I mean, pulling the trigger on a spray can is the easy part. It's actually how you get from nothing to actually pulling the trigger, the tricky part, and requires some um, some attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sheila. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, um, that was an insightful discussion around um, community effects. Even with just one net, we can achieve that. Um, perhaps we move on to the next slide, um, and um, I will direct this perhaps to Joe um, to talk to us, to, to differentiate these three nets for us. So the standard pyrethroid net, and then the PBO net, which is targeted um, to the resistance mosquitoes, and then the dual net, which is a pyrethroid and another um, active ingredient. Joe, please take it away. Yeah, I mean, I'll say a couple of thoughts, but I welcome, you know, input from anyone else because I'm really not an expert on this. But I mean, it, 
speaks directly to the community effect. So this was a good segue because I think bed nets are more effective the more mosquitoes they kill. And so when pyrethroid treated bed nets were first rolled out, I think the effect was, well, the effect was actually remarkable for two reasons. One, I think if we're speaking about Africa, the continent went from relatively few bed nets to a, a whole lot of bed nets. So coverage it just increased massively. And I'm speaking right around the year 2000 when things really started to ramp up. Um, but they were also increasing coverage substantially with a net that was ridiculously effective. It was effective at killing mosquitoes. It was effective at, you know, irritating them so that they took fewer blood meals. It was just worked on a whole lot of different levels. And as pyrethroid resistance emerged and then exploded and expanded and went everywhere, I think, you know, bed nets lost a lot of that uh, community effect. And so PBOs were a way to try to reintroduce a lot of that killing efficacy. Uh, I think PBOs were great in some scenarios, but still the next step would be a whole new sort of net technology. And that's why we have now uh, what I refer to as combination therapy. So we, I think we stole this idea right from like clinicians and drug developers. So why are we using one active ingredient? We should be using more than one active ingredient. And I think that pyrethroids plus clofenapyr and pyrethroids plus pyroproxifen both have a ton of promise. And what it does is that it sort of reintroduces this mass effect this killing effect and it tries to kind of like ramp up the community effect. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll stop there. I could keep going, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will ask Corinne to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. because uh, I'm, I'm very used to this three, <laughs> uh, of, of uh, there's these three ways in which WHO classifies nets. And the idea is that we have three major classes now. I think it's, it's kind of, evolving over time but now this is where if a net came it would have to fit into either of these classes we have nets that can kill susceptible mosquitoes those are just pyrethroid only nets i would say i don't uh, I, I don't know where we would get uh, susceptible enough susceptible mosquitoes yet i don't know and then we have uh, itns that kill host seeking mosquitoes that are uh, insecticide resistant and in that class i think the idea is to have nets like PBO nets, like clofenapy nets, and any other nets that would just have uh, uh, the activity would be to kill the mosquito if it was resistant. And then we have the third class, which is uh, new, um, where we have uh, brands like uh, Royal Guide and Olisec Duo, which and those are nets that contain uh, a sterilant like uh, Periproxifen that can, in addition to maybe killing the mosquito, can also sterilize mosquitoes. And the primary effect would be on the sterilizing effect of that companion uh, active ingredient. So th th that is where the three classes of nets are at the moment. I think this is what this slide is about. Yeah. Corinne, mm -hmm. are, these, are these classes defined to, as a guiding tool, or is it just a classification of, of current nets, or, or is it is it is this something that WHO has described to, to get product developers to fit into, or does it actually just describe what is existing at the moment? Does it make I think, sense, my question? Yeah, it does. And I think it's a bit of both. Uh, I think it's what we have at the moment. Who knows? Tomorrow we may have nets that do other things than these. We could have more complex nets, but that's what we have at the moment. And I think it's also to sort of streamline how these nets are evaluated so that if a new net comes, we can know what net we should evaluate that net against. So that's uh, the concept, I think. Yeah. I, have a, I have a dumb question. I mean, we have essentially four types of nets, if you include the ones that, that are not treated, okay? Am I unmuted? Yeah. We have four types of net, if you include the ones that are not treated. The question I have, and this is strictly operational, who makes the choice? How are these, how is this decided? And what happens to the old nets? Um, right now, I don't know if there is a recommendation for distribution of untreated nets, but I don't know that. Yeah. And, and, and forgive me, forgive my bias, but here's a lot of people complain that IRS is contaminating the environment, but there are thousands of mosquito nets that are plastic impregnated or plastic impregnated with insecticide that are going in the ground. And nobody seems to be paying attention to that. 
And here we are adding another set of mosquito nets into the equation. What happens to the ones that are there? Where are they going? What is happening to all this stuff? But, but again, the main concern about IRS is that it's contaminating the environment and it is so costly. Okay, but you know, where do you factor in the cost of manufacturing and distributing these nets and disposing of all of these nets? How is that worked out? I, I don't think I have the answer. I, think, I believe that there is a, a, at least a, a basic guideline now from WHO on how to dispose. If, if we have, in case we have any of our colleagues from PQ or from, from WHO. Here, therein or, lies, can, Fredos, forgive me for guidance. No problem. Therein no. lies the problem. Here we are, and forgive me for those people who work at WHO, but here we are, a bunch of people sitting in an office with air condition, okay, making decisions for the people who have no, no voice in, in the continent. Okay? How, how, who, how is this decision made that instead of going for untreated, we're going to go for P PBO? How is that made? Who makes the decision in the country? And how is that implemented? And what happens to the old nets? And what happens to the insecticide? We, we recycle the insecticide with IRS through the progressive rinse and we use uh, the leftovers for the next day. But that doesn't seem to happen for mosquito nets. And, and again, my apologies for my bias, but this, is a, this question has been bugging me for years. Yeah, if I could speak to that, I, I think that we all know that ITNs work and they have contributed to reducing malaria and it's a tool we want to continue to use. I think the, the focus should be on what can we do to reduce the impact on the environment and there are guidelines that WHO has released. So maybe it's about reinforcing the use of those guidelines for disposal of nets while we continue to use them and make sure that malaria continues to be controlled or eliminated if we can get there. And I'm not questioning the effectiveness of the nets. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against nets. Okay. Again, we're looking at integrated vector management and we're only using IRS and nets. What happens with the rest of the stuff that we have available? And we have a lot of stuff available all the way from monomolecular oils and, and hormones for mosquitoes, all kinds of stuff. But but yeah, none so of that we, seems we, to we, be we, effective. I think this is the this is the reason that so so for, for at least for this specific masterclass we we selectively focusing on you know doing a deep dive on, on ITNs and IRS and, and and I think it's reasonable for us to organize uh, uh, like we said in the beginning uh, and I think it was written on the chat as well that we probably should organize a separate class uh, uh, for uh, that broadens this aspect to discuss these other options. Uh, I want to say thanks to, to Manuel and also thanks a lot to, to Corinne uh, for and the Fred, explanations um, there. Yes, Sheila, before we yeah. move on. No, I just wanted um, to also remind you that in the chat box, we have some responses from WHO. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Excellent. And, and I mean, you, we should be maybe stopping at some point to just read this, read this as well or or, or bring in our WHO colleagues if they want to make a response. We will be talking soon about IRS in much more depth, but before that, uh, we would like, uh, Sheila and myself would like to talk to you a little bit about insecticide resistance, this VITNs and how that progression moves on. So we're gonna move back to uh, Seth Irish and uh, Natasha. Uh, here is a description from Imperial College uh, uh, from Tom Chasha's group. Uh, discussing the, the impact of pyrethrate. More recently, we have this uh, analysis that was done by uh, uh, Professor Steve Lindsay, where he kind of tries to explain why ITNs seem to still continue to work to, to have um, uh, a reasonable level of impact despite uh, the pesticide resistance. He lists a number of um, uh, reasons there. Um, uh, Seth and Natasha, I believe this is a topic that you guys have worked on for quite a while. Uh, given the nature of this masterclass, I do believe that our attendees will benefit a lot from some explanations. If you guys don't mind, could you, could you just take us through what is happening here, why ITNs uh, continue to perform reasonably well or so well uh, despite pyrethroid resistance? So either of you can start and, and, and the rest can share. Seth, I let you start. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll start with the easy stuff and then let Natasha take on. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I think 
you know, those, those points that are on the screen are quite good. And when we talk about resistance, we're talking about, uh, usually we monitor resistance in young, strong mosquitoes. Uh, and there's some evidence that show that the older mosquitoes that transmit malaria are not as resistant to insecticides as the, the young fit ones. So I think we, even if we have resistance, if we're finding resistance, it, it may not it might be preventing those young ones from dying, but potentially not the older ones from dying or being affected. Uh, there's the sublethal effects. And so you can, you know, maybe have, maybe it weakens them. I'm not, actually, I'm, I think this is something that can be looked at a bit more. I think some groups have uh, repeated uh, sublethal um, exposures to perithroids. Um, and, and I think, I mean, ITNs are also a physical, barrier as as mentioned earlier so i think there's a couple aspects of of itns that uh, continue to to reduce uh, that force of transmission and reduce the number of cases I'll let natasha correct me adam yeah i think my question is what what does that mean remain effective also because uh, yeah because i think we're not now comparing to untreated net, really, like this is okay, except at the mosquito level, we do, but then what's happening uh, from the mosquito level to the uh, like epidemiological impact, we don't have really this gap to see what, like, what is this reduction in mortality or in lifespan does affect. So, I think, except the, mod the model studies, so it's a little bit complicated to see. and. I was thinking about the, the, the study we did in Tanzania where we had 80% prevalence at one point in the start of it. Uh, okay, so we like, um, and then where we had 40% before and then after 40%. So I think I, the, the result of study and then with IMO where they show that there's still an effect, but I think it's just, uh, just to understand what, what does that mean? And I think while it was probably true when we liked emerging resistance, maybe I think now we have more and more, uh, yeah, I think we have more and more evidence that resistance, it's a, it's one, I don't think this is only the story. And I think I'm agree that there is much more about that, about the quality of the net. Uh, and about yeah usage. So I think there is much more about that the picture. But I think there is, uh, I think, yeah, I think we have more and more evidence to show that resistance has really an impact on, on reduction. And I think if we discuss of this idea that uh, resistance is compromising uh, community protection. Then and then we still have a personal protection, so that's I think that's something um, that's a problem. I think I, I want just to to go back to uh, Jack, Dr. Jackie Martin uh, study. She, what we were looking at it's uh, the PBO net, a torn PBO net versus standard net, and uh, looking so they were in terms of all index that was the same, but we could not find any dead any blood fed mosquitoes inside the net or even reduction inside the house compared to the standard net was the same. So I think this is again, not, um, this is not a definite answer, but it just did show that maybe what we were seeing with spiritual net 20 years ago, that's what now we see with the next generation of nets, PBU and everything, just to show that there is a reduction in effectiveness. Now, th doesn't mean that Sandanet don't work anymore, that I won't go so far, but I think there is, I think now more and more evidence that there is an impact and then is indirect. And, uh, but I think uh, we building on that, so. Yeah. So Natasha, are you saying, just, just, just for clarification here, and, and it would be nice to hear from Abraham on this topic too, actually, um, on one hand, you believe that insecticide resistance is actually negatively impacting ITNs. But on the other hand, you also think that the standard ITNs continue to work anyway, to a certain degree. Can you, can you clarify your thoughts on that? Uh, the, the thing is just, 
I think it's quite difficult to say they're still working just because, okay, they, like just because we don't, we, the only way it would be, yeah, experimental to looking at what you find like the standard net and uh, untreated net. And we see some reduction uh, in mortality, but I think less and less. I think uh, I think Corinne can also uh, show that in in the experimental health. But like in Tanzania, like um, the mortality of the mosquitoes in um, hut with standard net is less than ten percent, and and so I think or 20, 10 percent. So I think that's while they're untreated. Okay. So I think now we're looking really, and it's depending which area, of course. Uh, I think it would be different, but I think there is something happening for sure. And 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 yeah, again, is it like insecticide resistant issue? Is it a quality issue? I think that's also the other things, but I think there is a change. And so when now we compare a standard net to an untreated net, the, the effect is much le more less important than what has been seen before. What the reason is, um, I think that can be debatable, and I think there is some, but I think, yes, I think, yes, they're less effective than they used to be, and and we see that because the new type of net are much more effective than the, than the standard net, and so I think that's, yeah. Yeah, well, Thank I, you I, so, so much. Go, go ahead, please. Yes, um, if I could add something to that, I, I, I don't think we are able to assess how standard nets would compare to maybe no nets at all, so we don't know. But I also, uh, that's when you look at like bioefficacy studies and talking about things like herd trials and all that, you see a clear change over time. We've seen pyrethroid nets in the past were killing over 80%, but now you can't even get 10, 15, 20%. And it will be difficult for me to believe that that doesn't have at all an impact on uh, uh, the efficacy, the epidemiological efficacy of these uh, nets in the community. So I think that if we are getting new nets that are uh, showing uh, better efficacy than pyrethroid only nets and all that, then there is still a need to continue to consider insecticide resistance in the equation. It's, we need to maybe look at all the parameters together because I do agree that there are issues of things like uh, durability of nets and all that, that contribute. But to me, insecticide resistance is still a major problem. And because it evolves over time, that is not something we should ignore because these nets, maybe the, the trial, the five country study that was done showed that there was still efficacious, but what if now that we've had selection, even ongoing still for some years, maybe that is no longer the case. Maybe it's really showing that they don't work at all. I mean, the standard nets. So as long as uh, resistance continues to evolve, we should continue to do what we can to stay ahead of the vector. No, I mean, thank you. Thank you so much. And Imo, uh, Professor Imo Klenschmidt here, uh, authored the five country study. Um, and, and he is a co-author on this paper as well, um, um, uh, talking about this. So clearly, this is this is an important topic <laughs> that has many angles. Uh, and I think that uh, it is true, as, as people are saying in the chat here, we, we did put up a slide for the five country study, but we do have a slide from uh, Dr. Lena Lawrence's study on durability. Uh, uh, I don't know if we have it here, let's see, yeah. Uh, here, a, a lot of conversation on the chat about, about how long uh, ITNs are lasting. And I, it, it seems to me that we are focusing a lot on the bioefficacy every time this question is asked. But I, one of the points we wanted to raise to, to ask you experts was, you know, what do you think about this, this statement by Steve Lindsay and Imo in their paper that the physical barrier impacts is probably contributing uh, uh, to the fact that ITNs remain remain effective, uh, to, to the phenomenon that ITNs remain effective. So, I mean, we, again, we, we shouldn't dwell on this for a very long time unless someone has specific comments on the durability question. It's, it's, it's quite obvious in the chat and maybe we shouldn't skip it. No, I think, yeah, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm agree. I think the, 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 the physical durability uh, as an impact on usage. And so it has to be looked at. And 
and especially as I think they're, they're just showing that with increasing success and resistance, a net that is the, the, the protection offered by the insecticide is not as good when the net gets torn than when it's new. So I think there is some really, it's really important to that. I think what is interesting, I think, with the next generation of nets is that we, for the pyrotry net, we used to have long lasting net for really three years and the bioefficacy showed that, but then the durability was not at the same level. I feel that maybe with the next generation of net, we are starting to have like a bioefficacy that might match what's happening with the pyrotry net because the second AI or Pigo doesn't, might not last as long as the pyrotry. But I think it's really important as really being impact, especially because we've been distributing net every three years, which is most of the country are doing, and based on the bioficacy testing and not based on the physical durability. So at the end, we have substandard nets with lower bioefficacy and with lower usage. This is also, I think, uh, quite vital. So I think this is really something that needs to be looked at much more than, I think it's, the thing is, uh, 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 that's been, discussed for years and years and years, but again, we not move away from that. It's not, it's not like a surprise. It's been, uh, uh, Albert Killian has been mentioning that for like so many years, but I think we're still there uh, looking at the bioefficacy. Well, I think we now durability has more, but it's, it's there a little bit more, but it's quite important that it's taken into account when the distribution for the, the frequency and the mechanism of, of, of distribution. And I think Tanzania have been starting this routine distribution through the, the school net. And I think this is probably one of the best way because yeah. you bring new nets with different, uh, uh, with, yeah, different concentration of insecticide and then the effect, the efficacy effect, uh, effect, but also that's taken into account the fact that they are not durable for three years. So you don't have the elephant protected your population of the third year. So I think this is something that really need to be considered in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Sheila, I'm going to throw this back to you, but I have a quick question to Abraham. Uh, Abraham, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Abraham, would you? Yes. Would, what would, what do you think would do you think that at some point WHO should pre-qualify at least one bed net on the basis purely of durability and physical integrity, not bioefficacy? Um, uh, good question, but a difficult one. <laughs> but I totally agree with uh, Natasha, honestly. Uh, we shouldn't only look at uh, bioefficacy. I'll come back to that, but we should also look at uh, physical durability. And physical durability, I think uh, our, our colleagues from industry uh, can tell us uh, how the knitting and uh, knitting of the uh, yarn and fabric and so on affects this. Uh, and this is important. We, I've seen, at least uh, from my current work, I've seen two countries that have questioned, uh, uh, okay, they are not even using their own resources. So they, I don't think they are justified to question why those who support them should uh, distribute badness every three years when they, are, they have local evidence which shows that these nets wouldn't really last longer more than more than more, more than two years. So I think this is an issue that uh, uh, WHO might wish to look at, but it's not easy because uh, I've forgotten what we did uh, when I used to work for WHO. Uh, it's it's not that easy because uh, unless we we rely on we rely on data that has, has been generated by progress by countries and their partners and, and use this as, a, as an argument for asking whoever is uh, providing those resources to, to distribute bed nets maybe uh, every, every two years. But this is, this is really an important issue and cannot, cannot be ignored. Uh, about bioefficacy, I thought Natasha would talk about uh, uh, about uh, retention of uh, the non pyrethroid component. On uh, we will, on we will go, 
We will go to that. Oh, week. sorry. Oh, we'll, sorry. We'll, yeah, okay. Definitely, sorry, definitely sorry go to that. that. No <laughs> problem. No problem. Yeah. Shela, you can thank jump you. Thank you so on, much. On, on, on that question and then we, uh, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Shela. Yeah, perhaps um, I can direct this to Corinne. Um, so I think the current WHO guidelines, the published ones, um, and not forgetting that recently they said anywhere, but nevertheless, Corinne, um, where should we be using pyrethroids, PBO nets? Um, is it still dependent on the intensity of resistance or the type of resistance that it's more suitable for where we have metabolic resistance? Yeah, I, I think this is self-explanatory. That's from the mode of action of these nets. And PBO, uh, that's it, it reduces the these enzymes that are going to metabolize the pyrethroids. So that's the way the PBO works. And so you need to have mosquitoes that have elevated levels of these enzymes that metabolize pyrethroids. So you have, I think they will be much more effective in areas where you have resistance and that resistance is uh, it's due to metabolic resistance so and i know that the who guidelines actually are in that line that's encouraging that uh, pbo nets should be used in those areas where you have confirmed uh, metabolic resistance yeah yeah and in terms of um the intensity of resistance the current guidelines on the last point it says moderate to strong intensity. So does this mean that where we have limited or a very low intensity that perhaps we should still consider using standard nets? Yeah, I, I, I will agree with that. I think that if, if you have, if you don't have much resistance and pyrethroid only nets are working, then we should use standard nets in those areas. And PBO nets should be reserved for those because I think they're more expensive than pyrethroid only nets. So if there is a, a, a budget issue, then there should be a, a system to prioritize uh, PBO nets only for areas where we have moderate to strong resistance and where also the resistance is actually confirmed to be due to a metabolic resistance as you can have uh, PBOs. Uh, restore um, uh, uh, mortality or restore efficacy of pyrethroids in those areas. Otherwise, it will be, I think, a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Corinne. And I just see in the chats we have some responses from um, Lucia and um, Jennifer. WH. I wonder if they want to speak. But nevertheless, they're saying that. Yeah, it would, it would be nice to if they clarify yeah. that because because I. It seems that the, the latest guidelines do not specify the, yeah. the resistance levels. Mm. So uh, if, if we have our colleagues here and they want to clarify, that would be really, really nice. Hello, everyone. Yeah, this is Jenny. Um, yeah, so that's correct. And um, this is based on the latest systematic review that's, that was published. Um, and this, this showed that um, PBO nets were markedly more effective than, than pyrethroid only ones where there was um, resistance detected. The reason why we have expanded this to any level of resistance is the measures that we used in the paper to assess um, the frequency and intensity of, of um, insecticide resistance don't align exactly with WHO's uh, definitions. And largely we would think that these nets um, should be um, uh, distributed in areas where there's pyrethroid resistance as a not only because they're more effective but also because uh, to help with the insecticide resistance management in those areas and um, I put into the chat a little bit earlier the link to the latest guidelines which can be accessed both as a pdf and as in an online platform magic app so if you scroll down in magic app you'll be able to see what the latest guidance is regarding PBO nets and um, the link to the review on which this is based. Thank you very much, Jenny. Back to you, Fred. I really appreciate it. So, so I guess no more, we don't have to worry about the level of, the level of, uh, of resistance, the level of the Just, as long as it's yeah. metabolic. No, no, as long as it's resistance, <laughs> by retreat as long as it's resistance. By retreat resistance. Maybe yeah, I can just clarify with, oh, with this yes. is 
the, the, the reason why we, we also removed some of those limitations is because we realized that not all countries have the capacity to maybe even detect insecticide resistance, let alone determine whether it's metabolic resistance. So quick follow on question, Jenny, if, if there's a community where either the last time they demonstrate, the last time they looked, there was no resistance or they don't have any strong evidence for any resistance at all. Is there a compelling case to switch preemptively to PBOs if the cost isn't that different to try to uh, delay the emergence of pyrethroid resistance or is that still a standard net is the way to go? I think in this, this um, context, we, as, as somebody had mentioned earlier, although the guidelines we publish are broad guidelines, we do recommend that countries um, develop their own mix of interventions and start looking in, in particular contexts as, as to what may be appropriate for them. And so, and I think in, a, in an area like that, it would be good to um, start collecting data and see what is possible for that program based not only on what's happening with the vectors, but also what their budget constraints may be, given that at the moment, PBO nets um, are more expensive than pyrethroid only ones. Thanks. Yep, good answer. Yeah, uh, switching gears, Fred, um, is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Jennifer. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Fred. Yeah, uh, so perhaps a combination of all the factors that we've been talking about, um, durability, bioefficacy, resistance, um, affordability, and all that. Joe, um, there's this project, um, the new NETS project. Uh, please take us through, you know, just from the objective and the goal of the project, the methodology. And we always like to, you know, go into the details of uh, such projects because of the students that we have, and we always want to learn as we go. So please, Joe. Yeah, happy to. And again, happy to have anyone interrupt at any time to clarify or, or uh, make other points relevant as well. But so the new NES project itself is actually a giant project. And it has a big market intervention component. So like it's uh, helping to provide volume guarantees and co-payments for different newer types of, of bed nets. And so, and it also includes the support for some of the cluster randomized control trials, which are so, so critical for, for demonstrating incremental efficacy of new next generation bed, bed net types compared to old standard pyrethroid only. Um, one component of the new nets project though, are some pilot evaluations. So it, across four different countries in Africa, um, the new NETS project made it made new NETS available to some of the malaria control programs so that they could pilot different net types in different districts. And the pilot evaluations uh, path is helping to coordinate is trying to kind of track the impact of those bed net distribution campaigns that were using different products in different districts to see if you can see any differential impacts in, in a more or less uncontrolled observational manner. So this is very much complementing again, whether or not you can sort of see the improved efficacy that's probably apparent in the cluster randomized control trials in a more operational quote unquote real world setting. And you know what the pilots were trying to do was look at epidemiological outcomes and entomological outcomes and trying our best to incorporate some of the anthropological or human behavior you know, components to how do we think about why bed nets are effective in some places and less effective in other places? And of course, there's always an eye for, even if we can demonstrate an improved effect for a new next generation bed net, is that improved effect gonna be cost effective in the long run? You know, is it gonna basically avert so many cases that it becomes a cost effective public health intervention head to head, face to face with the old pyrethroid nets, which we know are still at least marginally effective. Um, and then, of course, you know, the durability monitoring, as we've discussed at length today already, has such an important component uh, about how long these bed nets are efficacious for in the field. Um, and so, yeah, we're, this data is collection is ongoing. This is the last year of these pilot projects. And hopefully, maybe in about a year, we'll have some more definitive answers. But 
by and large, it looks like in most of the places where these bed nets have been piloted, the results are very encouraging and it seems to be replicating a lot of the lessons that are learned in, in some of the cluster randomized control trials that have been published. So the new nets are killing mosquitoes at a higher rate and preventing more malaria in the process. Yeah, that's interesting, Joe. So there was a question in the chat around the differences in the efficacy between the three types of nets or the four types of nets that you have here. Um, could you share any preliminary results and where this has been effective, like where these studies are being conducted? Besides yeah, so happy to speak in very general terms because it's all still preliminary data. So please take it with a grain of salt. But if it looks like um, the chlorphenopyr pyrethroid nets uh, are the most effective. So there, there seems to be a clear benefit to those nets over a standard pyrethroid net. PBO nets and pyroproxifen nets also appear to be more effective than standard nets, but perhaps slightly less effective over two years than the chlorphenopyr nets. So if you had to kind of like rank which one is more, and again, we're talking about operational effectiveness here, not necessarily efficacy, which is measured by the randomized trials, but it looks like the newer nets are, are more effective than the standard old nets. The thing to remember is that the standard old pyrethroid nets still have some degree of efficacy or effectiveness that is really hard to measure. And so everything is like the incremental effectiveness. Um, now that is true in settings where the malaria burden is either moderate or high and the pyrethroid resistance is easily demonstrated. So across moderate to high levels of resistance and moderate to high levels of malaria burden, it seems pretty clear. It's a lot harder to see an improved effectiveness in a very, very low burden setting. And that was in Rwanda or in some settings in West Africa where the insecticide resistance profiles of the primary vectors are really, really complicated. So it seems like some areas of Burkina Faso where extensicide resistance is really, really intense and due to multiple mechanisms, uh, the, the incremental efficacy or effectiveness might be a little harder to demonstrate in a pilot setting. No, thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe. And we, just, just so you know, we will be talking to IVCC, especially on the market component. You, you, you yeah. raised the, the market uh, uh, um, catalyst uh, side of things. We, we're very lucky that uh, our colleagues at IBCC have accepted to do a masterclass for us, and this is coming on the hopefully, hopefully on May 26th, uh, we will confirm that as soon as yeah, we, 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 we know it, and some of these issues will come in. Will come in. You, you mentioned a number of um, um, uh, efficacy trials, and uh, we're going to throw this back to, to, to all of you here, um, except maybe, uh, um, yeah, we're going to throw this. Uh, up to there's not so many trials, randomized control trials already done on this new net uh, type, but we do have this beautiful trial just released from Tanzania uh, by Natasha's group. Um, we do have uh, 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 some great results from that one, particularly in, in an area dominated by Anopheles Fenestas. And uh, we have these two trials, one also from Natasha's group. Natasha, thank you so, so much. Uh, congratulations uh, on, on the great work you're doing with this new net. And also the trial from Uganda, uh, both of those are PBO nets. nets. And I think WHO has relied a lot on the evidence from these two trials here and also the most recent trial uh, uh, from Tanzania in making making these, uh, these decisions going forward. Most people have probably read about this. Um, the, the one that is least talked about is the one from Burkina Faso. Uh, I believe that Joe, you, you, you mentioned this briefly. As well, we have this trial from from Burkina Faso. Did I skip the slides? So this trial from Burkina Faso with um, 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 a pyroproxis and bed net. Uh, this is the one that seems to have the least of the effectiveness, the, the impact level. I think this is only a 12% reduction in incidence compared to the, everything else. I would like you guys, if possible, to explain to Shell and myself and to all the, the, the audience here a little bit about the new things that you see when you evaluate this business, especially Natasha, uh, Seth Irish, who works a lot with these trials. Uh, 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 what do you guys see that is new, that is interesting, that we should focus on when these new trials are being tested? And again, you can take it to whichever direction you want to take it. 
Uh, let's just talk about a little bit about the results of these trials. We can start with you, Natasha, uh, Corinne, uh, uh, Seth, uh, Abraham, whoever wants to, to take this one. Should I start? Or? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think it, yeah, it's, it's quite a few trials, so I'm not sure what uh, you want to focus on, but maybe just overall results um, for the present trial that was looking at intercepted GT. Correct. You, correct. You could just start with a, just an overview of it, because you are involved in many of them, just summary results for each of the trials, and we will be flipping the slides for you. Yes. So I think for, for this one, what we, so we compare intercepted G2 roll guard with this PPF, uh, so the hormone growth regulators, peroxyphen, and then PBO net versus standard net. And then we look at incidence and prevalence. So what we show is that for intercepted G2, we had reduction uh, in prevalence uh, up to 24 months, and also in terms of mana incidence, we nearly half of it. Uh, so that's the net that seems to be uh, working the best. Uh, then uh, Alicet Plus uh, worked also, and but that's much the reduction as much. Uh, it's not as important as the previous trial we did. Uh, first, it only lasts for one year. And uh, yeah, while for the other one, we had uh, like similar type of reduction in terms of prevalence in the previous trial and uh, over like um, yeah, nearly two years, 21 months. So I think there is a difference between these two trials. Um, then I can go back to that after. And then so for WorldGuard, we, you know, you're looking at this. So there is a reduction in prevalence overall, but and then, but not in incidence. But in terms of like power and statistical significance, it's not significant. So something that uh, Joe might see in the the pilot here, we could not see because we power our um, study to see a reduction of at least 28% prevalence. So everything that will have been lower than that, we won't have been able to detect it. Uh, so we see something in first year, but again, I think that's because of the confidence interval that uh, doesn't add up. So I think that's uh, really uh, for the, the two trial and also maybe one uh, other take home message for the, the previous trial done in, uh, in Omuleba looking also at IRS. Of course, it was uh, spraying for one time, but what we find is that when you were putting PBO and IRS together, it was not that better than PBO. But again, I think the problem, because we did only IRS a year, we don't know what will have happened in second year or third year when the net starts usage draw, uh, reduce and, um, the, yeah, and the effect is less important. Um, Maybe one thing's important to notice about the PBO net between uh, the first trial and second is we don't have the same uh, species population. And that's why, so in the latest, we have many fenestas. While for the previous trial in Muleba, we had many Gandhis and Cistricto with some fenestas appearing. But so that's why, like I can just say that it might have some different effect. And we are looking at, at that now in terms of entomology, just to see the effect that each of these products are giving on each of the species. Um, compared to maybe just also looking at the, the Uganda trial. So the Uganda trial was done at similar time than our first trial. And I think the, 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 the results are quite similar. And in a way that uh, the net are providing a uh, better effect up to like 21 months. And the Cochrane review uh, has showed that, of course, because that there is more power on that looking at two different trials together. And for maybe for the Burkina Faso, I think that's interesting. So the design was quite different from us. So I think what's happening is that uh, you see an effect and the net, the net might, the, the way the design has been done, uh, that's mean they're looking at, uh, new nets. So that's for us, we've been for Roga, which is we've been looking over two years. Here you have a mix of uh, new and older nets, and then maybe like a follow up that will correspond to uh, like a one year net. So, and also the, they have more power to see uh, lower, um, uh, less smaller effect. 
that's just so, so just for, for for the benefit of our audience thanks thanks a lot uh, uh, we, let's just summarize this uh, briefly for the benefit of our audience uh, uh, natasha the first trial we put here this is the trial with dual active nets correct yes and there and is here, a new net yeah and here compared to all the other new nets that you've tried this is the most impactful is that correct so the, the dual active the clofenapine yes. net yeah. Okay. The clofenapion is the most impactful. It's, yes. the, it's the most impactful. Okay, yes. cool. Uh, there, there is also a PBO net in this trial, yes, but it's, it's, it's not lasting as long. Yes, it's, it's, it's okay. working really well on incidents of, for one year. Right. And you say here that the, the dominant vector here was Anopheles fenestis. Yes. Okay. And then you have these earlier trials. The first, this is your Tanzania trial, and this was a PBO trial. Yes. And here you say it was also very impactful, but it did not last for a very long time. No, it was impactful and it, it lasts for a longer time. So here it lasts up to 21 months, the same thing that they find in Uganda. And that was Correct. done with Sistricto. Correct. Okay. And the trial in, in, in Burkina Faso, this is not a randomized control trial. This is a step wage design. It's a randomized control trial, but yes. with a different design. Yes. Step wage. And so the nets are not as durable. Some of them are just released, so they're kind of new. And here the impact was much less. But yeah, it was less, but I think we, in a way, yes, in terms of reduction of prevalence was less, but they, the design is enough to show an effect. Correct. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody in the audience have anything to add about this trial? Okay, Seth, are you still with us? Yeah, I, I, I think I was, I was just thinking to add that these trials are, are so important for, for us. I mean, I, I was working for PMI for, for a long time and we, we were waiting almost on a daily basis, like, is the study out yet? Is the study out yet? Do we have the information? Uh, because they're so powerful in showing, you know, the, the real impact of, of the nets. And we can do our, our bioassays, which are important. We can uh, look at the experimental HUT results, which are important. Um, but in, at the end of the day, what we really want to know are, is can these nets have a, an impact in reducing malaria? And so I think just to note that that this is so important. And I think what's really interesting is is with the new nets that they're they're trying to kind of get more information from from the data that we have available to us on a on a more regular basis, which is which is great, but also has challenges. And I think you know eventually we want to get to the point where uh, you know, countries are, are looking at their own data to see the impact of the interventions that they're using. And I'm sure some countries are already doing this um, because then, then you have the data of what did this net do in my country and, and what kind of impact did you have? And, and I think that's, that's uh, you know, hopefully what the direction we're going. Yeah, I have to say also that I think we've got to give credit to, to our colleagues at WHO uh, you know, with this with this trial, it was always interesting that the data came out and it was, you know, the, <laughs> there was a policy statement almost within, you know, within a few months. You know, you kind of you kind of do that. Uh, historically, you would have all this data and then you have to spend a lot of time convincing people to hold a meeting to do that. And I think the receptiveness, of the, the, the way uh, uh, the, the policy making organs and, and also the people working in groups such as VCAG. Uh, um, the, the degree, to, the, the, how the way they have been so fast in, you know, taking this data, analyzing it, and putting it. It was very interesting, Natasha. Actually, that in one of your papers, in the concluding statements, you actually said that WHO has already used this evidence. I don't know if it's, it's a, the, 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 the the publication itself says that that WHO has already used this data. Uh, uh, and made a change. So, so Fred, I think that, Fred, that is really, really nice. Yes, yes, Sheila. 
so sorry to interrupt. Um, Jenny has her hand up. Um, yeah. So perhaps, yeah. Okay. Jenny, we're sending some kudos your way and the whole team at WHO Vector Control Group. But take it away, please. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Well, actually, also in, in response to that, we've been working with Natasha and colleagues and also a systematic review team who have already been commissioned by us and will be gathering the data from these latest trials, which will be looking at both um, IG2 and Royal Guard. And we hope that um, that review will be available hopefully by quarter three of this year. Um, VCAG are also um, going to be looking at the data probably sometime in October, I believe it is, and we'll be then assessing the public health value of these two nets, after which we will be um, pretty immediately convening a guidelines development group to then look at um, uh, the evidence from the reviews with hopefully a recommendation to be made one way or another, um, probably in the early part of 2023. Thank you so so much, and we will we'll be looking forward um, uh, forward to to that. Uh, but we're going to uh, move forward, and we will spend the next uh, period talking about mostly IRS and and all that. But for the sake of of, of the students in the audience, there's a slide here that we want to show before before Sheila takes this up, just for for the sake of the the partners and the. The, the students and the postgraduate students or so people who are new to this subject. Here is a, a download from the current WHO pre-qualification system. This was downloaded today and it lists the current IRS products and the current ITNs that are already pre-qualified, that a country can buy, that the country can use. Uh, many of them are dual uh, are uh, PBO, uh, uh, there is at least one dual active net there. Uh, 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 Corinne, you work in this space much more than me, and Shayla, so you can you can explain a little bit if there is anything that that you think is worth worth noting here before before we proceed. Uh, Corinne, please. Yeah, I, I I just know that here we have all, all the products that uh, PQ has reviewed mm -hmm. and such a found the evidence to be acceptable for them to be added to the list. And here I can see that it's a combination of different uh, types or classes of items and also different types of IRS products. It's encouraging to see that there are multiple brands of the same class of products. And I think that that's a good thing. And also there are, especially for the IRS part, for, for many years we haven't had a lot of alternatives for IRS. And it's good to see that there are alternatives that are coming up. We have uh, the protianidine based IRS products, which is a good thing. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Corinne. Uh, back to you, Shina. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, yeah, so it makes sense for us to look at how to test the efficacy of, of these new nets, the three types of nets, um, is anything changing? And I see here on this specific publication, it was, um, I think, a combination or a collaboration between WHO, Seth, I see you here, Corinne, um, Natasha. Perhaps um, um, I wonder who to choose now because all of you are on this, but perhaps continue with you, Corinne. Um, to explain to us the main changes, the main method methodological changes that are being proposed in this specific study. Um, so this was a, a consensus uh, SOP that was developed by many partners already working in this, in this area. So it's just based on um, the experience that people have had with these new uh, insecticides that's, I think what, what was done was uh, a series of uh, standard operating procedures were collected as to how people were testing uh, pyrethroid and clofenapine nets or pyrethroid and the pyroxifen nets. And then that was put together to come up with something that sort of represented uh, uh, the ideas that the, the different partners had at the time. So, um, I think it, it's really a change compared to what uh, the WHO, initial WHO guidelines 
had, and because those guidelines were more focused, are uh, more focused on uh, pyrethroid only nets. So, but now we have nets that have pyrethroids and another product on it. We can't continue to use those old uh, uh, guidelines. We need to have a method that allows us to assess the pyrethroid as well as the companion AI, that is uh, the PBO or the chlorpenapi or the piriproxifen. So we have to be able to assess uh, the two of them at the same time. So in, in what is being actually promoted here is the idea to use maybe a resistant strain to assess the companion AI that's for PBO and uh, chlorpenapi nets and also for piriproxifenates. So that, that way you, you can reduce the confounding effect of the pyrethroid in the net. So you need to use a resistance strain to assess uh, um, the companion AI, but also that requires a lot of testing. So this consensus SOP, it goes into a lot of details as to how you can also streamline that testing so that you're not testing uh, the same net against two different strains, each piece that you cut out of the net, that's a lot of work. So it also proposes ways as to how you can cut down on the number of tests. Maybe you can, instead of testing every single piece on the net, you could take one or two pieces. So there's a lot of detail involved here, but there's also some work that needs to be done to validate some of uh, uh, the, the methods that are proposed here, it, it may not work entirely, or there may be things that have not yet been taken into consideration. So there is uh, the follow up from this is to try to validate these methods. Yeah. Thank Maybe you, I can I can just add on to that. Yeah. This was this was an extremely challenging uh, work to 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 do, and um, I think it was it's it, it's an imperfect. SOP. I think I, I don't think there's a perfect SOP uh, out there, as far as I know, um, because you have all kinds of challenges. Like you know, Corinne talked about using a resistant strain to try to understand the impact of PBO, but you know, we know that resistance in even in, in well-maintained colonies can vary over time, uh, and so how do you know that you know what if you're resistant? Um, which can be oxidase based or based on other things. How do you know that that ma maintains its the exact same level over time? Uh, and how do you understand the variation that might just be part of the natural variation uh, in that system? And so I think um, that it it's yeah I think it's it's, it's an imperfect. It was it was kind of our best attempt at, at trying to develop SOPs and uh, I see John in this point, this was not a consensus. Certainly this was not meant to be uh, imposing a, an SOP, but more actually more proposing uh, something to the community that could be considered and hopefully with, with more input can be improved. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Seth and Corinne. Uh, Fred, back to you. Yeah, I've, I've seen the, the point, and Sheila, just so we, we don't miss if there's any point in the chat that we need to, to bring up or if someone has a specific question. Uh, Mike, I can see your hand. Maybe you can type the question on the chat and we'll, 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 up, we'll, we'll bring that up as well. Uh, yeah, um, the well maybe I could call on you shortly, actually, uh, as well. There's a point by Angus there that there's also a paper that has come out on strain characterization. So, so uh, our audience might want to look at that as well. Shall we now talk about IRS a little bit more for the last few minutes? You are or last uh, uh, indoor residual spray. So um, we're skipping some parts here just for, for sake of time. These are the current WHO recommendations on IRS. Strong recommendation. Uh, interesting because we don't we don't actually have randomized control trials for IRS. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> talk about that, but um, and also some recommendations for how you do this uh, uh, in, in uh, emergency situations. But let's start with uh, Abraham. Uh, Professor Abraham, uh, if you're still with us, this would be great. This is a paper that you wrote with Chris Curtis. Uh, hello? Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. Here's a, a publication you and uh, uh, 
uh, the late Professor Chris Curtis uh, uh, wrote about uh, comparing indoor residual spraying. I know we asked this question uh, in the beginning and, and you guys kind of already attempted to ask it. But, but in this paper, you kind of implied that broadly speaking, indoor residual spraying can be very powerful and in fact, in a number of cases, much more powerful than ITS. Uh, and, and you gave, did some, some great reasons in this, in this paper here. Uh, uh, Professor Christian Langella, whom we call Mr. ITMs occasionally, uh, wrote a rebuttal immediately to this paper. Uh, uh, he, he clearly did not agree um, with what you had said. Uh, and uh, we've asked him recently, and he, he categorically thinks that ITMs are far better than indoor residual spray. Uh, Abraham, we have you on the line. We would like to hear your opinion on this subject once again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Fredros. A very difficult question uh, because this work was done a long, long time ago and things have changed today. Uh, but I, I still strongly believe that, uh, like we discussed at the beginning, there are certain areas or epidemiological areas that would benefit more from the use of uh, indoor residual spring than the use of bed nets. Uh, of course, this was before we had next generation nets uh, because of uh, the problem of sex resistance. Um, maybe the reason why my, my, my colleague Christian uh, stated his position that way was because our 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 study was not a randomized controlled trial. Uh, it was a comparison between villages, and and that could have contributed, or, or rather, uh, made the, the 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 study rather weak. Um, having said that, uh, I, I I I I don't know. I mean. I have worked, I mean, I've, I've, I've done a lot of work or rather worked with programs that uh, did IRS as well as uh, distributed bed nets. I think both have uh, different challenges. Uh, maybe I'm repeating myself here, but uh, you, you go to a program that was doing very well with the IRS because there was capacity. The capacity is not only uh, to spray the sex side well on, on the walls. It's, it goes back to quantifying uh, accurately the quantities that are needed, training these people to apply the insecticide, uh, applying the insecticide uh, at the right time of the transmission season. Of uh, course, we are, say, we are talking about just before the beginning of the trans transmission season. And we have seen this capacity deteriorating uh, in many, many programs, uh, programs that we are doing very well. So the, the, the question of which one would do better, I, I don't think is, is really an important question now. I, I think it's, we rather focus on, you know, building the capacity of, of these programs to implement either one of them. That, that's what I, I, I would say at this point in time. But because we are talking of, uh, uh, of, of, of the comparison between nets and IRS, uh, 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 the issue of next generation nets is very important. And in fact, uh, Fredros and uh, Sheila, we, that was an, a very good question from Thomas who asked us, what will happen to IRS following the rollout of next generation nets? I think this is an important question that we need to, you know, look for. I mean, to to have a forward-looking uh, 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 approach. Uh, but if you are not distracting the dis you uh, the the the, 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 the is there a lot of background noise? <laughs> Yes, I, I think this is an important question, but also I don't know where I heard this, and that's why I wanted really Natasha to comment. I hope I'm not sidetracking the discussion, but 
I've heard of uh, people mentioning the issues. Dear colleagues, please, please mute yourselves if you're not speaking. It's difficult to manage that from this end. Halfan, if you're still, uh, please mute everybody else who is not speaking. Talk of issues related to retention of uh, the non peripheral components of uh, dual nets. Uh, maybe Natasha would like to say something because this is important for programs uh, and, and also, you know, for, for, for the impact on, on malaria, uh, reduction malaria transmission. I'm not sure I answered your initial question yeah, you, well, you, you, but- uh, you, you, you did, we, we going to- stop there. No problem. Shayla, Shayla, Shayla we'll, we'll, we'll take this forward and then we'll come back to, to Natasha. Yeah, thanks, Fred. So um, Fred and I were discussing earlier on why we, we are currently seeing sort of like IRS is on the decline and bed nets are on the rise. I mean, the implementation of it. Uh, most countries are now implementing bed nets compared to IRS. Uh, we were wondering why perhaps it's related to cost, maybe not. Um, anyone on the team wants to answer? Um, I, I would like to, if I can, yeah. I would like to share, share yes, an yes, image. Please. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Manuel. I would like to share an image with you that may okay. shed some light on why, one of the reasons why IRS is perceived to be so, so uh, expensive. Let me see if I can if I can do this. Here's can you see that? It's coming. Yes, we can see this. This is why IRS is so expensive. Because it, I in, in many programs that I have been in, this is what I find when I go there. And then we have to re essentially rebuild the campaigns because the equipment has not been properly maintained or kept or you know this is on the top right image that that is perhaps a hundred thousand dollars worth of stainless steel waiting for someone to uh to repair it and that takes time that takes effort and this is the norm rather than the exception in a lot of places including in south in south america Okay, how do I get back to you <laughs> to undo uh, this? Manuel, Manuel, that's important. Before you stop sharing that, uh, just yeah, keep I'm, that slide. I'm... Just keep that slide there briefly, one minute. Um, okay, it's, it's really important that you bring this up. And and we're do you going think back, if, if we're going back a question to the politics, of go ahead, go ahead, please. If we're going back to the politics, I think. If you allow me the second image, here's politics in action, okay? Here's an IRS campaign that I did in, in West Africa where the guys in the orange are supervisors, the guys in the yellow are team leaders and everybody, is, everybody else is in a team. And this was essentially, or actually it was, a press conference held by the Minister of Health and the President to tell the country what uh, IRS was all about and what we were going to do and all that stuff. And it was very, very effective. But going back to that one, this is, this is in my impression, why IRS is so expensive. And I've seen this in uh, quite a few places. And I know I'm not going to mention any names to protect the innocent, but you know who they are. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Back to you, Shayla. Uh, um, yeah, Seth, Seth, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, push back a little bit. I mean, I think the cost of the of the spray equipment is is definitely something that is is a cost of IRS. But insecticide, I'm just I'm looking at PMI does these uh, cost of IRS reports that are available on their website, and I'm just looking at Tanzania and the the main costs uh, appear to be the insecticide, the actual operations, um, and not so much the spray commodity. Like the, it's not so much the the actual pumps and and other spray commodities. So I think no. there are a lot of costs 
involved in in IRS, and and that's why uh, in a lot of cases we were we were not able to continue uh, conducting IRS bec just because of the the overall costs. And there's certainly ways that you can reduce costs, and and, with, and I think there's a lot of people looking at how how can you reduce the costs? You know, getting getting local programs involved or potentially you know reducing the amount of spray surface that you spray in a house um, but but when you calculate IRS versus these new nets it's it's really difficult to justify IRS in a lot of cases Manuel can you can you stop the video the, the sharing I'm not sure how to do this but let me see if I can just, do that just, just stop sharing all right uh, hang on. There you go. Yeah, no, thanks. 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 There you go back. Yeah, no, it's all it's right. It's all right. We have that. Go ahead, Ash. Seth. Seth, did you finish? Oops. Yeah. yeah. Okay, a quick question to, to, to you, Seth. Uh, sorry, Shayla, doing this, but quick question to you, Seth, before Joe takes this. Do you think there's a, a chance that indoor residual spraying will completely disappear? No, I don't think so. I feel like it's, it's used for a number of purposes and I'm hopeful that we'll find, um, you know, insecticides that are cheaper um, and cheaper ways to apply the insecticides so that we can get get back to using it um, at a wider scale. I think uh, the challenge is, is just the cost. So I, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing the technique or its effectiveness. I'm just thinking about the costs. And, and the, the fact is there's limited resources for, for malaria control, and we need to do our best to to do the most we can with the with the fewest dollars. In, in the past, when we were spraying the when we were spraying pyrethroids, uh, I remember as a PhD student, we still had lambda cyanotrin. At some point, maybe it was just coming to an end, but, but they were being sprayed in, in milligrams per meter square. Remember, and and, and then come things like arctalic, and you you spraying grams per meter square. You need you need like you know, a bottle like this to spray a house. Um, we see from some of the work that Joe and colleagues are doing, you see this graph here, which suggests that when this switch was made after 2011, uh, the, you know, the, 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 um, the uptake of IRS was really declined. We're looking forward to speaking more to IVCC guys about, about this. I mean, what do we need to do to bring this to bring this back, uh, at least for countries that still want to do IRS? And this is a question to to all of you and, and to Manuel uh, as well. If you if you just give me a few seconds, I don't think our, our our goal should be to bring IRS back. I'm not saying it's it's bad. It's not good. We want to control malaria in in the most effective and cost effective way we can. So. Uh, I, unless unless there is something you know long term, I don't think that we should be. Our goal shouldn't be to to do IRS. Our goal should be to control malaria. I think I think we need to go back to this IBM idea. There are places where I, uh, IRS is justified for whatever the reason, and I don't want to get into the details. Uh, and there are places where the combination mosquito nets and, uh, and IRS will work better. And it's not a matter of, of either or, okay? It's a matter of actually combining the tools we have to make it more effective against the vector. And, and, and there is the problem that we haven't, we haven't gone through that exercise. And don't forget, and don't forget that IRS is still a very important tool against Chagas disease. And the decisions that, that the world makes regarding IRS, if you say IRS is not effective for whatever the reason, and I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent, I'm saying if, if the, recommend, the global recommendation is IRS doesn't work, 
there goes Chagas pro, uh, programs. And that we're having an impact globally uh, when WHO and all the other powers or World Bank Malaria campaign say, we're not doing IRS. What are the guys doing uh, uh, Chagas control going to do without that tool? And I, and I don't have an answer, but we need to sit down and figure out the answers to this question. I mean, that's, it's, clearly, it's clearly impactful, it's, uh, uh, but, but also the, the available data suggests this decline. I think for us, this is really the reason we think it should be discussed more. Um, Joe, your, your hand is up. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts in my head, but I mean, mostly I do just kind of want to try to find the common ground because I think Seth is exactly right. Like the end game here should be, what are the tools that we have available? And actually Manuel said exactly the same thing. What are the tools that we have available to control malaria? And I think that IRS can just be extraordinarily effective in a lot of circumstances. And it's hard for me to imagine a maximally effective global malaria program without IRS. And Another thing I just, another point I wanted to make is one of the reasons IRS is so expensive is because it, it is an annual campaign. It's something that you do have to do every year. And there's a risk that we kind of oversimplify. Like it's not easy to do an ITN campaign. It's not easy to distribute ITNs by any stretch of the imagination. But the fact that it is a slightly longer lived intervention, I don't think it lasts for three years. None of us realize it doesn't last for three years. But the fact that you don't have to do it annually cuts down on costs and makes the logistics a little easier. And so there just need to be ways to figure out how to do everything that we can do and to layer interventions on top of one another and combine interventions. And the fact that the two core interventions, even though we don't use that language anymore, the, the two interventions of whatever we call it are IRS and ITNs. There have to be creative ways to combine them and combine them with other malaria prevention tools in, in, in cost-effective ways. And you know, we still need to do a lot of work to understand those situations in which it's going to be maximally effective. And, and just another quick plug, right before the new NETS project really got going, there was the engineers project and that slide that you have up there was from engineers. And, and there was quite a bit of compelling evidence to show that IRS with a non-pyrethroid combined with pyrethroid only bed nets gave you an incremental impact. So it was it was more effective than either was alone. And in most scenarios, especially in high burden settings in Africa, it was expected to be a very cost-effective combination of interventions. Now, the problem is that the bed net landscape kind of changed overnight. And so we don't know how well these interventions play if you're using a, a newer combined net or a dual AI net. Um, so a lot of this will probably have to be repeated, but there are ways to combine these interventions to squeeze out you know, even more impact from your vector control dollar. Yeah, that was a no, definitely. Kind of yeah, definitely. We, we, we did see the, the studies from Mozambique, especially I think uh, 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 Shella lined up uh, some, some questions for you from some studies from Mozambique. Uh, as well. Maybe we, we uh, proceed a little bit um, with this. Uh, Seth, two quick questions for you that you can answer in rapid succession. And uh, number one, let's start from, where do we start from here? Let's start from here. These are two studies by Smith, long, long time ago. We believe that these are some of the earliest, these are some of the earliest evidence underlying the, the, the functioning or the the, the performance of IRS. Uh, we recognize, however, that these studies were done a long time ago, at a time when housing structures in Africa were very different. Uh, housing structures have changed in Africa quite a lot. And, and as we, we see in the, some of the studies from, from Ifakara, uh, even with these modest changes in housing, as you see in the picture there, the, the behavior of mosquito resting surfaces in the houses changed quite a lot. So consistently we see here 40% of mosquitoes are not resting on the roof, they're not resting on the wall, they're resting somewhere else, either under the chairs or... And when you put a metal roof in a house, it changes the, the mosquito resting surface significantly in, in these houses. But the IRS was designed at a time when this was the norm, what, what you see on the slide like that. So it would be nice to, to get a comment from you guys about how we might adapt 
The second here, also very quick succession, you mentioned earlier that there are ways to simplify IRS uh, to make it cheaper. Here is a nice study that you guys did. I believe you did this in Ghana. A fantastic uh, example here where you spread either the top half or only the bottom half and your conclusion is still it. The answer is the same. Or as they say in my village, the difference is the same. <laughs> Please comment on these two things, uh, uh, Seth, and, and other speakers. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I should first emphasize that, that you know, especially now that I, I'm working part time for WHO, the partial spraying is not a WHO recommended way of implementing IRS. Um, but it is something that we are interested. We were interested in looking at. Could we get a similar effect from spraying only part of the house? Uh, could that be a faster way and we could say have cost savings in labor? Um, might it be a way that we might not have to remove everything from the house? Uh, and this study, I think, showed some, some compelling evidence that we could save up to a third of the cost of IRS by doing partial spraying. Now, uh, PMI is continuing to do some, some work on this to, to look at, um, you know, further work and experiment huts and potentially some some other studies to to evaluate this but i think it's and yeah suzanne mentions the targeted irs against 80s i think the the tsetse fly um, control people always remind us mosquito folk how little we know about mosquito behavior and how important that's been for for their control programs and i i think we do need to understand mosquito behavior we do need to you know do, look at how mosquitoes are resting in in houses with tin roofs, with cement blocks, with mud walls, uh, to understand whether we can reduce the amount of insecticide we use even further. And that might be a, a way to kind of open doors for more IRS to control mosquitoes in a more effective way. Uh, and so I, I think this is quite an exciting avenue of research. Um, and, and there may be you know other creative ways to reduce the amount of insecticide that we use and, and still have a big impact or even greater impact um, and so so yeah so i think it's it's quite an exciting way to to think about controlling mosquitoes and especially you know i think somebody made a comment earlier about the ability to use many different kinds of compounds i think with nets you always have to to do something that's safe in contact with people for eight hours a day uh, and maybe there's ways that we can use other insecticides that we wouldn't be able to use for nets um, for that kind of application. Yeah, if I if I can say something quickly, I I would just say uh, yeah, Joe has has put that point. It's just something I wanted to talk about, and I'm wondering if we really had iris insecticides that could last beyond. 12 months, even going up to two years, would this not really be a, a better option? So is it not maybe about uh, doing more research into developing those much longer lasting IRS insecticides? Because we, we've we had insecticides that go beyond 12 months. So maybe this could be a solution to uh, using IRS and making sure it's still cost effective. Yeah. One quick remark, and then well can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's one of the reasons IRS was really effective in the Americas in like the 60s and 70s, because DDT lasted for 18, 24 months, like with high efficacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we lost DDT, rest in peace. Um, <laughs> you know, now apparently now uh, there's even no manufacturer of this uh, that is pre-qualified. That. So I know that politicians always bring DDT up, but apparently you can't also, you really can't buy a pre-qualified product. I might, I might be wrong, but you don't see any product on that. Hey, Manuel, you wanted to, to say something. Now, if we, if we, if we add the, the changes in the structures of the houses in, in say, Africa, okay? Yeah. Uh, there are there are less openings in the houses today than there were about 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. So if we do a more targeted approach to finding out where these mosquitoes are resting, uh, it may bring the combination of nets and IRS 
to a little more effective because what one misses, the other one will catch and vice versa, you know? So, but again, we need to, we need to look into that. What impact is having uh, not only in, in access of the vectors to the people inside the house, but what impact, how can we modify these campaigns to fit into that uh, new um, uh, building structure? Because we're, we're still operating on five or six years ago when you know, houses, most houses were mud and thatch and whatnot, yeah. and that's not necessarily the case. Definitely, definitely. And, and that brings us to an interesting point. I don't know if Marcy, um, and my colleague Marcy from Mozambique is still on the line. Um, how do we involve people and how do we to review that? Uh, Marcy, if you're, if you're there, this, this, these are slides that I, I took from your PhD, actually. Forgive us for doing this and also from your most recent publication. Uh, your work observing what people do after their houses have been sprayed, the fact that they modify the surfaces, they paint these walls, it's as if they don't like to, to have IRS on these walls. Marcy, are you there? Hi, Frederic, yes, I'm here. Oh, it's a talk noisy to, place, but... Uh, talk to us about this very briefly. What, what's happening here? What's happening We're in, the, in the picture or the paper? <laughs> so... Uh, can you hear me, Frederick? Yes, we can. Okay. I hope my, the background is not too noisy. Let me know if it's too noisy. Because I'm in a, a restaurant, so it might be too noisy. Yes. Yeah, so with this study we did on household uh, modification in Mozambique. So the overall goal of this was to try to understand um, human behavior around IRS. So if we if you look at, for example, bed nets, we see that bed nets, we have so many studies and so much information around uh, human behavior, how people behave around bed nets, uh, its use, integrity, and uh, its durability in general. But when it comes to IRS, for instance, you know, in most cases, we just go to the field, we deploy the, the, the IRS in the communities, and then we select a few houses and we monitor the how long the candidate insecticide lasts in terms of my efficacy. And then during that time, during the spring campaign, what we do else is to also uh, collect the coverage that's achieved. And so with this, uh, we use only these uh, two indicators and maybe the, the vector's uh, behavior for uh, evaluating the impact of IRS. So uh, when it comes to bedness, bedness, there's quite a lot that's going on around bedness because it, 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 there is so much focus around red knots in general. So our question here, our main goal was for this study in Mozambique, uh, in this we so the, 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 the question was to try to, to, to see whether people in areas where IRS has been going for several years, uh, whether what people generally do in their houses, because often we go spray and we leave. And as I've mentioned that we just pick a few houses to monitor the general efficacy, we document the coverage, but we don't normally look into what really happened uh, into people's houses after IRS has been done. So we wanted to capture whether there is uh, some sort of uh, clustering uh, wall modification of any kind, like people painting their houses, washing, uh, clustering, and so on and so forth. But this could be because of several reasons, not just because they don't like IRS, but could be because of just general maintenance. And we also wanted to also look at uh, after IRS has been done, whether communities uh, add a few houses or structures which could be used by people for sleeping or any other activity, which could also expose them to risk of mosquito mites if they are not uh, sprayed. And also to try to understand, you know, how long it takes till they're in the field to be able to deploy IRS uh, in general and use this information to, um, to try to understand uh, uh, to evaluate how, uh, to compare how we currently evaluate the impact of IRS versus how uh, uh, things happen uh, in, in the field. So what we saw with this study, what, what we did was we saw, we, so we, we went into two districts uh, in Machituini and Boane district. So these are two districts with a very long IRS history. And uh, so after the campaigns, so we walked every month and we looked at whether people, we asked questions and looked at whether people were doing these activities. So they, we found that uh, in Matutuini, for example, there was quite a lot of people in our houses which were modified either by painting, washing, uh, after six, uh, every month, after six, so we followed for six months. 
And we also saw that there was quite high uh, frequency of people building a new structure from the compounds and so on and so forth. But when we looked at the Boane on the other side, we saw that the frequency, the activities were happening in this community, but the frequency of doing these activities was much lower uh, between the two districts. So one of the key things we think could have driven this as well is because Matatuina is also a bit of a, 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 it's a very growing community, fast growing community, and Boane is more, a, a bit more um, built than uh, uh, Matutuina district. So what we we went ahead and looked at how if people do modify their houses and we have new structures on the compounds built over time, but we normally don't take into account when we do uh, uh, evaluate the impact of IRS. So how what would this mean in terms of uh, the general yeah. uh, outcome of, of, of IRS evaluation in general? So what we found out that it, yeah. yeah yeah. So what we saw was that uh, uh, if we have these activities ongoing in the communities, we saw that uh, wall modification and just having uh, households, people build new houses on the, on the compound will definitely reduce the actual coverage that we are seeing remain constant over a period of eight, eight months or nine months until the next spray season. Because we often assume that if we spray a district like Montreal, a district, for example, uh, the 90% coverage that's covered in that community is the same until we go next time next year in August to do the spring. But if we take into account the fact that people are conducting these activities in their houses, the communities are growing, uh, so these particular changes that are made are likely to affect the coverage that we often assume uh, remains constant. And this has uh, Thank you. Thank you an impact yeah. in terms of, yeah, Excellent. Thank, thank you so so much uh, uh, for, for for that uh, uh, consideration. I, I think we 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 drawing towards towards the end. Uh, we we have a uh, few last questions, uh, maybe three or four questions. Uh, one on actual implementation of IRS that we want to ask Manuel about, and other questions on IRS uh, IT in combination. Sheila, please, uh, if you can take this. Uh, yeah, I think Manuel wanted to say something. Yes, the, you know, just a, a short comment. And two images before where you see you know, what happens after the house is treated. To me, that is a, that is evidence of a, uh, the community not understanding the message of, of what they should do after the treatment is, you know, after the uh, intervention is completed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Manuel. Yeah, um, so perhaps this, um, uh, anyone can answer. So in terms of measuring the impact of IRS, as well as bed nets, um, where there's um, high burden and where there's like in areas where it's countries are heading towards pre-elimination, and considering also the different mosquito behaviors such as outdoor biting or intense outdoor biting compared to indoor biting, what is the impact of IRS and bed nets in these scenarios, especially like comparing the two scenarios where there's high burden and low burden? What is the true impact of these two interventions? Anyone can comment. I Maybe you question. can I, oh, Manuel. Now the question yeah. is, you, you can do so that. Or, no, go ahead. You can do that or I can project a, a slide for Natasha here because she has done a study specific to this as well. She can help address that, um, that, that as well. Go ahead. Now, the, go ahead, the, Manuel. my question is, with so many variables, different vectors, different behavior, different uh, structures, the houses, uh, behavior of the people, the teams and everything else, how can you conduct a Cochrane review on IRS? Mm -hmm. So can we say that then IRS is perhaps best suited for pre-elimination countries or would just would that be like a too general a statement to make? But, but here's my, my general statement, okay? IRS uh, eliminated malaria from a lot of places. And if it didn't eliminate it, reduce the vector population significantly, 
and you saw a reduction in disease, okay? And, and I need to go back to the beginning. I mean, any program that eliminated malaria, and there's about 100 of them before 1985, did so with larvae siding and environmental management, okay? You cannot argue with success. I don't think that you can put a Cochrane review to something like IRS with so many different variables, even within a country or a village. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Manuel. Natasha, you've conducted several studies um, with bed nets and IRS in Tanzania and elsewhere. Would you like to comment? Yeah, so I, I think for me, I don't think IRS should be, I think IRS is really effective and I think dropping it's really an error. I think you need to stay in the toolbox. And, and then I think like here, it was clear. So what happened here is that, okay, we combine IRS and net. That's the time where net usage was quite low and um, also where uh, there were some insecticide resistance. So the standard net, we didn't know. But so IRS was really successful. We did a, uh, it's not here, but we did a study in Burundi looking at IRS and net. And IRS repeated every year. We, we just showed that they were like, if you were using a net or not using a net, you were still protected. So I think, it's, I think it's really quite important to see that it's an effective tool. Uh, now, I think mean, the question is about who is this next generation of net? How is IRS going to compare? And I think that's quite important to do. And I'm, I'm, I wanted to that, put that on the chat. Uh, I think it's, what's important is looking at the cost effectiveness, but like to like, because a yearly IRS is a high coverage. It's not the same than distributing net on one, like every two years. And I think we need to be, make sure we compare. And if we want to compare, we do IRS at high coverage and net high, high coverage. And at high coverage is not one distribution company every three years, is one distribution maybe every two years or routine. So it would be much more expensive. And I'm, when we with Manuel, we need to see what's happening also with the, the net use. So I think it's quite important to have both. And, I, and then I think there is need Still need to have more work to see what's happening with dual and IRS, but we cannot really do this kind of work now because it's either or, and which I think I'm agree it's not the way the way to go. So I think uh, I think the, the study we did also where I we combine IRS and then um, and then PPO net because there was pyrimethosmethane and all said and then PBO they might maybe they were like um, there was not the best combination. So I think it's quite important. I think I feel that IRS are still. Uh, in high area, burden area, to be able to drive down the malaria further. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, thanks, so Natasha. Natasha. So it's only, uh, go ahead, Sheila. Go ahead. I was just going to say that it looks like with the new nets, with the new types of nets, that there are more opportunities to combine IRS um, and IT. And um, back to you, Fred. Yeah. I think so you were saying maybe, that, that with the. Yeah. With the, with the new net, it's it's more unclear. It's unclear whether okay. So back a little bit. So when these trials are being done, it was very hard to demonstrate that ITNs and IRS are better than either of the two on their own. And I think that the, this this specific study here was probably uh, one of the very few that demonstrated this this effect of the combination. Uh, and, th and then there was the study from Mozambique that someone uh, referred to earlier, um, um, uh, which used Perimifos methyl as well. Uh, I think this is what the one that Joe was, was referring to. Uh, 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 this is a study uh, Shella picked up from, uh, from Carlos Shakur's uh, work. Uh, uh, but the WHO position on this, as it is, let's see if we have that. The WHO position on this at the moment is still about please try to implement just one of them. Don't implement, implement, implement uh, uh, both. Uh, it would be nice to to hear first of all from, from and Natasha, it would be nice uh, uh, that you comment on this as well. Is Are you saying that we shouldn't take that position yet until we know what the ITN IRS combination will look like with the new net scenario, or are you saying that we need to reserve IRS in the arsenal and not lose it 
uh, and, and that it should always be used to used together with ITN. So some clarification around that, because the WHO position here suggests that you shouldn't use both of them together. Uh, uh, some of the studies suggest that depending on the choice of the pesticide, you can actually see value. Uh, Manuel, it would be nice to hear from your point as well, because of the logistics of this in a large uh, scale program can be very difficult, especially if you're paying for nets already and then you're paying for for IRS. So let's start with you, Natasha, on, on that, and then and then we have from from Manuel and there. So. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's again too difficult to answer because I think it, it depends on where it is, and I think, like I say, yeah, we probably yeah with the standard net. We should at least with adding IRS with uh, low net usage that was really beneficial and that might be also happening uh, with the, the, the next generation of net, especially when the usage is decreasing and they're not doing the, 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 the job. Maybe also depending on that, we have much more um, insecticide for IRS that we have to put on net. So let's say we move away from pietry nets and then we go to the next generation of net and leave. Yeah, for now, clofenapyr is the best one, but are we going to flood everywhere clofenapyr? And what about insecticide resistance? I think it's going back to IRS is really useful for insecticide resistance management. And I think what we really need to demonstrate is that if addition of IRS plus this new generation of that is uh, have a synergist, and then we can really improve that and then really reduce malaria because the goal is to reduce malaria uh, and then eradicate. So if we don't put all the best two together, um, I don't think we can do with one again. So I, I think this, I think the either or, I think it's a problem. And I know it's a financial issue, but I think that's maybe what needs to be targeted now is the financial issue. How do we get to make sure that we have enough budget to get uh, appropriate coverage. Um, if in area there is high transmission, can we put both? And I think with all this micro stratification that Africa is doing, I think it could be done. I want to see where that's uh, the best uh, combination possible. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, Manuel, go ahead. I need to, I, I made- Can I contribute? Energy. Manuel, go ahead. Manuel, Manuel. I, I made some enemies a few years back when I wrote a paper that was published in the um, Global Health and Development. Uh, and the title was, Are We Doing the Right Thing? Are We Doing Things Right when it comes to malaria and vector control? And, and that got me into a lot of hot water. And here's the situation. The problem, in addition to the images of, uh, that, I, that I showed you a few minutes ago, the problem is that every time we start a campaign is the first day. Why do we disband this, this effort? Every time we say, okay, go home and everybody goes home. And then next time we start again, it's the first day. Why is that? This needs to be a, a semi-permanent, if not a permanent position to the people who are managing this, not for the teams, for the people who are managing these campaigns. Otherwise, we're doing the first day every time we start. And that is not a very efficient or effective way of conducting any business. And especially one that requires a truckload of money. Okay. So why is it that we tell everybody when the, when the campaign is finished, okay, go home, see you next year. But then next year, nobody shows up because we have to start over again. I, I, don't, I, I think we need to change that idea. The other thing is, uh, dang it, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, but but here's, you know, that is a key. Are we doing things right and are we doing the right thing? I don't think when it comes to IRS in vector control, for instance, in general, I don't think we're doing the right thing or doing things right. If you look at an example of the United States, the mosquito abatement districts in the, in the United States have permanent budgets and permanent positions. Full stop. And, and they, there are malaria vectors in the United States, but they are under control. And there are no significant cases of malaria in the United States. The CDC picks up maybe 1,000 or 1,500 cases a year. But that is not a problem that will overwhelm the, the uh, capacity of the country to respond. 
but why are we doing IRS the first day every time we start a campaign? We need to fix that. Thank you so much, Manuel. Are you proposing that countries should have a, the countries implementing IRS should have a standing IRS force, kind of? Well, the, several things I'm proposing. The countries managing or, or, or running IRS campaigns need to have someone at the head, someone who can make, make a decision. But you take a country, a country like Zambia with uh, something like 25 provinces or districts, there is no way one person can know all the details of all 25 provinces. And there is, it doesn't make any sense to me to have someone at a province in, in Luangwe, for instance, in Zambia, trying to make decisions, waiting for someone at the minister to make a decision to say, okay, go ahead, okay? We need to have mid-level managers who can make decisions on the spot and modify the plan. There needs to be a plan because nothing works without a plan, but the plan needs to be flexible. So we need to have people who can make decisions on the on the spot based on what they on what they find on the ground, not what the minister is telling them to do. I'm nothing against the minister. Please don't get me wrong. Don't send me any uh, nasty emails. But the thing is, we need to we need to get practical about the whole thing. And again, why are we reinventing the wheel every time we do an IRS campaign? These people who are in the managerial level, be that the top or the mid-level managers need to have a permanent position. And, and at the mid-level managers, they don't need to be PhD entomologists. All they need to do is figure out what needs to happen based on the information they get from the ministry so they can make decisions. Thank you, Manuel. Thank uh, you. We had, Fred, we had a hand from Jenny. I don't know if she's still on. Yeah, we have a hand from Jenny and from Mike. Uh, so why don't we check this, Sheila, and then round up your last question. Yeah. So Jenny, uh, Mike, and I think, yeah, Jenny and Mike, and then we, we round up, uh, finish. Uh, Joe, is that a legacy hand? Uh, before? So after Jenny, Joe can, can, can do that as well. Yeah, Jenny, please. Okay, yeah, it's just going back to the, the previous slides you had on the WHO recommendation and on combining IRS and ITNs. Um, the, one of the the issues with the evidence that was produced, and Natasha mentioned this, is actually whether combining the interventions is just making up for a gap in protection because of the low coverage of ITNs. Um, and so with the review, the systematic review that was produced, it was sometimes unclear without going to the studies directly as to what the coverage of the ITNs were in those particular situations. At least in a, in, a, in Natasha's study, you see that the the coverage was that coverage was like thirty six percent, so that was for ITN. That was pretty low. Exactly. So, so it could be. Booked, yeah. yeah. So it could be that IRS is actually just making up for that coverage gap, and so the the recommendation that comes out is actually talking about whether you you know would you roll it out if you've got good coverage of both, and at the moment we don't have the evidence of what what extra benefit there may be of IRS when you already have good coverage of nets. Um, and one, one of the other things, though, is, is as was mentioned, this, there could be an argument for combining them both when you have resistance to one of the in, insecticides that are used. And so the IRS um, using a different insecticide, non-pyrethroid in this case, could, um, could prove to be effective. Um, that having said, this is a conditional recommendation, and conditional recommendations from WHO based on the fact that the evidence may not be very certain or that there are other contextual factors to consider. So there may be particular contexts where this would be appropriate. And um, one of the issues, as has been mentioned before, is for countries to actually look at their particular situation and see would their situation be suitable to the combination of the two and more importantly, do they have the funds to roll out both? Because if they do, and or they dedicate more funds towards that, there could be a reduction in coverage and um, vector control in other areas or other interventions against malaria. So that needs to be considered. Thank you so much. Back to you, Sheila. Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Jenny. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, Joe? 
perhaps your comment on that discussion. You had your hand up. Yeah, in the interest of time, um, I think we can kind of skip me, but it's a, but this recommendation right here is such a challenging thing to, uh, to digest and understand. And I think it's also important to realize that two points. <laughs> Manuel made it earlier too, that perhaps the Cochrane review upon which this is based, it's not actually a good methodology to use to make a continent-wide recommendation like this. And also it was based on a very, very small number of studies. So really, it just isn't enough evidence to come to any sort of formal conclusion one way or the other. Um, and sometimes I think it's a mistake to use that dearth of evidence as as moderate certainty of of, of a not a, not a effect. No good. And good I'll just no, no thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, there was one last hand, and then we can close. Uh, Mike, are you still there, or did you did you get your question answered already? Uh, otherwise, share please uh, uh, check it up, and we can ask for last words from our partners and. Uh, Get that. I think we still have one last question. Yeah, we have one last question. Um, uh, Corinne, this is a cheeky one. So um, it's around the use of experimental hats um, for evaluation of IRS and ITNs. Um, perhaps just your general comments, Corinne. Is this the best we can do? Like, is this the best method for evaluation? Um, especially where you have other um, factors in play like outdoor biting and outdoor resting. Corinne, okay. please. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think experimental herds have been around for a really long time. And uh, the idea is that they mimic like the real household setting. And that way you can have a, a good picture of how a product would perform and you're simulating real household conditions. So I think that they have a place. They are really an important study because you can control the conditions. You can replicate treatments in the same type of household setting. So I think that they are really a good way of measuring uh, efficacy of products. But I understand that now we have outdoor biting, but if these products are, because I, I wouldn't say that an ITN or, or an IRS would be developed to target outdoor biting, but the purpose of experimental heads is to actually demonstrate what uh, the product efficacy claims are. So if a product was meant to control indoor vectors, then it makes sense to continue to test those products in experimental heads because it's still the indoor setting that we are looking at. So in my mind, I, I don't know if it would be possible to come up with something better than the experimental heads. There is a, a room for improvements. We could modify the design to make sure it better fits the uh, real household conditions so that there can be modifications but there is still a need for that semi-field household setting for testing indoor vector control products. Fantastic, thank you Corinne. Fred, do you have any follow-up or should we wrap up? No follow-up, uh, uh, Lena. I think if I can mention myself, I think overall the message that has been coming around that wasn't spoken though is the need uh, for countries to uh, build capacity uh, to implement these interventions and uh, to investigate the potential of these new new types of nets, new formulations of IRS. And, and uh, as Manuel was saying just about now, uh, that at regional level, you probably don't need very high, highly trained, well, you, they need to be highly trained, but they don't need to be PhDs, but you do need to, uh, to, to have a, a very good workforce to, to implement these things and also to invest, evaluate them. So that's a point I just wanted to raise there. Uh, other than that, uh, Shela, it's been great. Uh, I think we've been very lucky uh, to have this, and I'm gonna hand this back to you, Shela. Thank you, Fred. Um, so perhaps we should just get um, a final word from all our uh, fantastic uh, speakers today. Um, I'll just mention a name and then you can go. So I will start with um, Natasha. Just a few minutes, um, a few like a sentence or so. Yeah, thank you. I think it was really uh, interesting discussion. I think, I think we saw like most of the, the the issue coming is financial. It's not even now uh, in terms of, I think there is 
product in the pipeline for IRS. There is probably product in the pipeline with net, there is vaccine. And then I think the idea is how we're going to implement that all together. And if we do have to do either or, how are we going to achieve the goal? So maybe I think the discussion is about more about how can we leverage more uh, fundings. And I think uh, the Richard thing that the, the gap between what we should, like I think we're spending $3 billion uh, dollars in Malaya and then we will need the double one just to be able to have a proper coverage. So I think um, I think it's probably some discussion about that to see oh, do, do we really want to eradicate malaria and how much do we want to put in that? So I think that's my last thought about. Thank you, Natasha. Joe? I want to say that this was a lot of fun. And despite the length of this session, we barely scratched the surface. And so like, I'm excited to see this conversation move forward. And let's not forget that we're still talking about IRS and ITNs and hopefully the vector control landscape is about to get even more complex with even more- We did, we did three hours, I'm surprised you're not tired. Yeah, well, I'm tired, <laughs> don't get it twisted. <laughs> But anyway, these conversations are gonna to have to march forward and, and, and the malaria control and vector control landscapes are only getting more complicated and these issues are gonna become more and more important. So um, just, yeah, it's exciting. So thanks. Thank you, Joe. Manuel? Just, um, just to make, to be clear, I'm not against anybody. I'm just trying to be the dissenting voice so that we all work from the same, like the musicians say, we all work from the same sheet of music, okay? We need to work together. And and forgive me, you guys at IFACARA, I understand you're in Africa, but the decisions and the implementations that are done here and the discussions that are done here, including the, the vector control working group are global. Don't forget that if, if a comment and this will be my parting shot. If a comment against IRS comes up internationally, it will affect those people. And there were 233 members in this um, discussion, many of them, a handful of them from South America dealing with Chagas disease. They will get affected directly. And with that, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I look forward to future discussions anytime it's only like 10 10 o'clock my time so anytime i can be of any help let me know i'll be happy to help thank you so much manuel corinne yeah thank you and thanks for inviting me a second time i mean it it has been a great discussion for me um th there are two things i really think we should continue to think about going forward. Now we have all these vector control products and now vector control has become even more complex, I think. And there is a need to find ways to optimize how we deploy these products. And having said that, I still think that we shouldn't fold our hands. We need more products. We shouldn't stop innovating because the vector doesn't stop changing. It's changing behavior. It's getting more resistant and all of that. So we still need to to be in the spirit of developing more vector control products and also continue to look at how best we deploy these products. So I think that that for me is like a closing message, thanks. Thank you, Corinne. And finally, Seth. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think just thinking about the financial considerations is, is probably natural for me having worked for one of the malaria funders for for so long and I am hopeful that uh, the people on this call are working to kind of become smarter so we can make better use of those limited resources. But I think uh, I'll just draw back to a point that Silas made earlier that this is a disease of poverty and really probably economic advancement is, is probably one of the big ways that we can actually uh, move towards eliminating malaria. Thank you, Seth. I'm being reminded. I'm so sorry, Abraham. Uh, you're the last one. <laughs> no, thank you very much, uh, Sheila and uh, Fredros. Great discussion, great leadership from the two of you. Um, I, I think uh, I follow what Seth uh, has just mentioned, that re resources uh, are dwindling every year. 
and this is a fact, uh, between 40 and 50 percent of most of African national malaria strategic plans are unfunded. So I think it's time really African countries uh, step into, into this and um, attempt to mobilize the domestic resources uh, to make sure that uh, the, you know there are no existing gaps in terms of resources so that we achieve uh, the goal for malaria elimination. Unless we do this, honestly, we'll just be talking about malaria elimination and nothing will happen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, to all of you. Fred, back to you. Well, just to say a big thank you. Thanks, thanks to everybody and thanks to you, Shayla. Uh, uh, this was a wonderful session. Three, uh, three hours later, there's still 50% of the people on the line. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of a lot of you attending live here and also watching on YouTube. We are very grateful for your, for joining us. Uh, we hope that um, at least some of you are experts will, will join the next master classes. We will make an announcement when we we have the confirmation. We hope that our next master class is on on 26th uh, with IVCC. Uh, sorry that this took a lot longer. Uh, we went three hours. We should have ended around two and a half or less. Rather than that. We are grateful and we do hope that you have a wonderful week, weekend ahead, a wonderful day today. And may you, uh, uh, may this be a great day. Thank you so, so much. And we're going to end it right here. Thanks again, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. Great week.